Sergeants, if you could please start your recordings. Sergeant Jones, you may begin with your opening statement. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchise Joint with Committee on Technology. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their videos? To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. And if you wish to submit a testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. And again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. And thank you for your cooperation. And we are ready to begin. Good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Francisco Moya, Chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm pleased to be joined by uh, Councilmember Bob Holden, Chair of the Committee on Technology, to hear a, a very important topic. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has shined a spotlight on socioeconomic and racial gaps in particularly every sector of society. Uh, this includes the divide between those who can rely on the internet for remote work and learning and those who cannot. This uh, digital divide influences whether students in our city are learning in optimal conditions, whether workers must risk their lives and leave their homes to access computers uh, or high-speed internet, and whether seniors must risk their health to obtain essential goods like food and medicine. New York City has a long way to go to close this divide. The cost of high-speed internet and relative uh, lack of choice of service providers are barriers uh, for many families, especially those who have been uh, hardest hit by COVID-19's economic fallout. Some of the city's lowest income neighborhoods are home to the 10 community districts with the fewest broadband subscriptions. Nine of the 10 neighborhoods with the lowest percentage of households with broadband subscriptions have poverty rates higher than the citywide average. 18% of New York City homes have no internet connection. Limited access to home computers and tablets also heightens the barrier for students in low income families to engage in proper remote learning. With the school year well underway, uh, we must operate from a place of urgency in closing the digital divide. Uh, these families cannot continue to be left behind. Uh, we look forward to hearing from the administrations about steps it has taken and its plans uh, to make remote learning more accessible. Reliable and affordable internet for all New York City residents should be the long-term uh, vision uh, for all of us, that all of us share, uh, whether in the mayor's office or the city council. Uh, cities around the country have made strides towards municipal internet, and it is well established, and it's well established problem that internet users in many other countries pay less money on average for faster internet uh, than we do in the United States. Now, today's oversight hearing will explore uh, the work uh, the administration has done to help close the digital, digital divide. Uh, since our city experienced the earliest known cases of COVID-19. We will also hear a pre-considered authorizing resolution submitted by the mayor pursuant to section uh, 363 of the charter uh, for the granting of franchises for the provision of telecommunication services. This authorizing resolution would permit the uh, issuance of requests for proposals or other solicitation for the provision of information services in the inalienable property of the city including using pipes, conduits, and similar improvements. The proposed resolution would authorize DOIT to grant franchises for a period of five years from adoption. Any franchise agreement entered into pursuant to this authorizing resolution would have a maximum term of 15 years, including renewals. The last time uh, the council adopted such an authorizing resolution was in 2013. We look forward to hearing testimony from DOIT about what uh, an information service is and how solicitations issued pursuant uh, to this authorizing resolution will help narrow the digital divide. Uh, I now uh, open the public hearing on this authorizing resolution and on our oversight uh, topic. Uh, with that, uh, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, that we have several members before I turn it over to uh, Council Member uh, Bob Holden. Um, we are joined by Council uh, Member Rivera, uh, Council Member Kalos, Council Member Landers, Council Member Reynoso, Council Member Vallone, Council Member uh, Grudencek, Council Member Ulrich, uh, Council Member Ku. Uh, am I missing anyone else? I think I got everybody. If I missed you, I'm sorry. I'll come back to you. Um, and now I want to turn it over. 
to Chair Holden uh, for his opening remarks. Thank you and good afternoon. I am Council Member Robert Holden, Chair of the Committee on Technology. And thank you for joining us for this timely and important hearing. I am pleased to join the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises chaired by my Queens colleague, Council Member Francisco Moya. Today, we will be focusing on the challenges of broadband internet distribution and access in New York City. We'll also be hearing a pre-considered authorization resolution submitted by the mayor pursuant to section 363 of the city charter for the granting of franchises for the provision of telecommunication services. The authorizing resolution sponsored by council members Sal Salamanca and Moya uh, by request of the mayor would authorize the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications to grant non-exclusive franchises for the installation of cable wire and or optical fiber associated uh, and associated equipment um, in the uh, non-transferable property of the city of New York to be used in providing one or more telecommunication services within the city. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced our city to undergo drastic changes, social distancing measures and efforts to reduce the spread of, of and exposure to the coronavirus have jump-started and a uh, rapid transition to the online world. Uh, New Yorkers especially rely on quality broadband internet to continue with their daily lives. And we know about that, it would, with, it's the new normal and uh, of the socially distanced New York City. Additionally, as a new school year starts that implements a blended learning model of in-person and online classes, high-speed internet access is essential so that students do not fall behind when learning from home. However, the pandemic and its consequence of online transition highlight the disparities between those with home internet access and internet uh, capable devices and those without. The internet has become one of the most primary pathways to participating in modern society, from submitting job applications to keeping in touch with loved ones. And during the current pandemic, the internet is proving to be even more crucial as a means of finding information about COVID-19, working from home, going to school, and finding places to get tested for the coronavirus. As our city and our society move forward, we must do our utmost to ensure that we do not leave New Yorkers in the dark. We must ensure that the city of New York is a leader on these issues. We look forward to better understanding the challenges faced by those looking to distribute broadband internet and those trying to obtain quality internet services and understanding how the city can better serve its residents and helping bridge this digital divide. We wish to work together with City Hall on this critical issue and look forward to hearing the valuable testimonies from the administration, uh, experts, community advocates, and of course our constituents. This testimony will provide crucial insight into the existing problem and provide the necessary groundwork for future resolution, uh, so future solutions, I'm sorry. I'd like to thank the Technology Committee staff, Council uh, Irene Bohofsky, policy, policy analyst Charles Kim, and the staff of the Land Use Committee for their hard work in preparing for this hearing. I'd also like to thank my Chief of Staff, Daniel Casina, and Communications Director, Kevin Ryan, for their assistance in preparing for this hearing. We will be sticking to the two minute clock for all public testimony. Uh, we will now turn it over to New York City Public Advocate, Jumani Williams, who will provide an opening statement. Thank you. Awesome, can, can everyone hear me? Yep. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Jumani Williams, as mentioned. I'm the public advocate for the city of New York. I want to once again thank the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises Chair Francisco Moya and Committee on Technology Chair Bob Holden for holding today's hearing. About 230,000 or 38% of New York City's households earning below 20,000 per year do not have any internet access. The consequences of this are clear. People are outside of libraries with laptops, students struggle at home to complete homework. Accessing telehealth or teletherapy can be a challenge. The internet, the internet is more important than ever, so these situations are very troubling. The lack of internet access is not a concern for people who can afford it, but for shelter residents and others who can't, it matters. The City Bar Justice Center's 2019 survey of former and current shelter residents in Manhattan and the Bronx 
found 67% wanted but had no regular access to the internet. Another 75% felt access would help in finding permanent housing benefits or a job. We know the people who are struggling for weeks, if not months, to get unemployment benefits. But what about those people who never had a chance? What will happen to them? The city's digital divide also places a burden on New Yorkers who rely on public assistance. Amongst 800,000 city households with internet access, about 350,000 receives SNAP and 425,000 are insured by Medicaid. Internet access is not a luxury, it is a basic right that can open numerous doors. But we still have thousands without reliable access as some SNAP and medical centers remain closed. This compounds the inequalities for the poorest New Yorkers. We must recognize that the digital divide only got worse this year because of the pandemic. Now is the time to push forward more solutions to minimize disparities, such as universal broadband for all, or allowing students to keep their iPads. Uh, we talk about the disparity in the schools, but imagine uh, as we're trying to get through and we can't see our loved ones uh, not having internet access, what that means if you're sick and the healing process that comes by seeing your loved ones. I thank the chairs for allowing me to speak and I look forward to today's testimony. Thank you. Okay, back to Chair Moya. Thank you. Uh, thank you to our public advocate. Uh, thank you to Chair Holden. I also just want to acknowledge that uh, we were joined by uh, Council Member uh, Rory Lansman. Uh, I'm now uh, going to turn this over to our committee council to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair Moya. I am Malika Jabali, counsel to the City Council Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises for today's hearing. I will be moderating with Irene Bajofsky, counsel to the City Council's Committee on Technology. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. Irene and I will call on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called as we will periodically announce who the next panelist will be. Instead of, or in addition to testifying during the hearing, you may email your testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. That's testimony at council.nyc.gov with digital divide hearing in the subject line. During the hearing, council members who would like to ask questions of applicants or members of the public should use the Zoom raise hand function the raise hand button should appear at the bottom of the participant panel. At the end of public testimony on each item, I will call for the meeting to stand at ease while we'll check to see if there are any more members of the public who wish to testify. As we adjust to hosting public hearings via Zoom, there may be extended pauses as we encounter technical delays. We ask that you please be patient as we work through this format. We will first hear testimony from the mayor's office of the chief technology officer to testify on the oversight topic, followed by the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, also known as DOIT. We've tasked both offices with keeping their testimonies concise and to the point to save time. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to three minutes, including responses. We will now hear testimony from the mayor's office of the chief technology officer or MOCTO and do it. Today, we will hear from John Paul Farmer, the chief technology officer. Mr. Farmer will also be available for Q and A. Do it is being represented by the deputy commissioner for legal affairs and franchises and general counsel Michael Pastor, who will also be available for Q&A. I will now administer the oath to both panelists. Please raise your right hands and we are going to make sure that both of them are available. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth? the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions. I do. I do. Thank you. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record and Mr. Farmer, you may begin when ready. 
Good afternoon, Chair Holden, Chair Moya, committee members, and public advocate Williams. My name is John Paul Farmer, and I serve as the Chief Technology Officer for the City of New York. I'm pleased to be with you today to discuss the mayor's commitment to universal broadband for all New Yorkers. I will discuss the steps that the mayor's office of the Chief Technology Officer has taken in order to shift the broadband market to meet the administration's goals, including ending the digital divide, reversing digital redlining and racial inequity, and ensuring that all New Yorkers have affordable access to high quality broadband, including 4G and 5G networks. One of the primary roles of the mayor's office of the chief technology officer is to address digital inequity through broadband and digital inclusion. The office's work on universal broadband is comprised of demonstration projects, a series of research reports and standards and policy setting. This work has incorporated feedback from stakeholders ranging from community organizations to startup internet service providers to longstanding industry incumbents. Our years of work in this area culminated in the release of the New York City Internet Master Plan in January of 2020. The Mayor's Internet Master Plan is the most ambitious plan for citywide broadband in the nation. It has pr been praised by many of the country's leading broadband experts who have called it groundbreaking, innovative, and the most thoughtful and comprehensive blueprint by any major city. The Internet Master Plan is accompanied by the largest single investment by a municipality, $157 million in capital funds, announced by the mayor as part of the city's COVID-19 response in order to advance these goals. The Internet Master Plan is a 5G technology plan, it's an economic development plan, and a digital equity plan. To understand the city's approach, it's critical to understand the challenge. The current system is broken. Letting the market alone determine how to serve New Yorkers has left 3.4 million people behind. 40% of households are without the combination of home and mobile connections. An astounding 18% have neither. They're completely disconnected. These households are disproportionately in majority minority neighborhoods with high rates of poverty. Digital inequity is a historic problem built into our city's infrastructure. The pandemic exacerbated New York City's longstanding digital inequities is laid bare by New Yorkers' sudden need to learn, work, receive healthcare, access services, and connect with loved ones entirely remotely. In order to reverse the inequity built into our neighborhoods, we must change the way we build and deploy this foundational technology. The solution to these challenges is described by the Internet Master Plan, which commits the city to take several actions. First, the city will partner on building or acquiring new infrastructure in areas of lowest connectivity. We will invest in new infrastructure that can be shared by multiple broadband operators and for a variety of different technologies. Second, the city will leverage public real estate to expand 4G and 5G networks equitably. We will remain on the cutting edge of technology advancement, but we can't allow the geographic patterns of tech and equity to continue. The city will identify priority neighborhoods, those of lowest connectivity, highest number of COVID-19 cases, concentrations of NYCHA developments, and assess requests for high value assets and weigh them in concert with investments in these priority neighborhoods. Third, the city will enable service delivery by supporting and promoting the use of new shared infrastructure by internet service providers that meet the city's broadband standards for equity, performance, affordability, privacy, and choice. In addition to the newly affordable services that households will, will have, the Internet Master Plan is projected to generate an increase in $142 billion in gross city product and 165,000 jobs by 2045. Early implementation has been key. After issuing the Master Plan, the Office of the CTO took steps to accelerate the impact. We issued a request for expressions of interest with the New York City Economic Development Corporation for rapid response internet service options for NYCHA. This RFEI proved the theory of the master plan that when the city leverages its assets, new internet service providers, including MWBEs, 
will offer low cost or even free service options that meet the city's broadband standards. We expect to announce the new low cost service options at select NYCHA developments later this fall. We distributed 10,000 tablets to isolated older adults living in NYCHA after the COVID-19 impacts made clear that this population was particularly vulnerable. We also assured that every single recipient got digital inclusion support to make the best possible use of these tablets. Working with a senior specific technology nonprofit, tablet recipients received support in learning to operate their tablets, navigate the internet, engage in free classes and community gatherings, and connect with family and friends virtually. The Office of the CTO's research demonstrates that this digital inclusion support is a key factor in ensuring successful adoption of technology. We are preparing to release the request for proposals, the RFP for universal broadband and the coordinated access to city owned real estate assets, making available open access infrastructure and enabling new internet service options. Steps we've taken already include coordinating participation of more than a dozen different city agencies that are contributing real estate assets to expand these service options. Developing an interactive digital tool for RFP respondents to understand the location and distribution of city assets and for the RFP review committee to be able to assess the neighborhood wide impact of proposals. In terms of next steps, once the RFP is released, the city will want to maximize opportunities associated with it, engaging longstanding ISPs and new providers, identifying and offering digital inclusion resources, coordinating digital offerings from community-based organizations such as healthcare providers and educational institutions, coordinating workforce opportunities with infrastructure and network deployment, and measuring the impact of all of these activities on New York City's economy and on individual New Yorkers' health safety, prosperity, and mobility. The strategies that I've described here represent a shift in how the city's technology will be built. We aim to bring an end to digital redlining. Our approach will present opportunities for new to the market internet service providers, including minority and women-owned business enterprises. So they can create or expand networks in underserved neighborhoods in line with the mayor's priorities. For the internet master plan to succeed at scale, coordination and cooperation are key. Industry, city agencies, and lawmakers must align to leverage city real estate assets, regulatory controls, and partnerships in order to shift the current market structure and increase low cost internet service options for New Yorkers. The strategy also builds on the best work that city agencies and non-governmental partners have achieved in recent years, expanding MWBE access, increasing jobs and skills, coordinating resources targeted to neighborhoods in need and continually leveraging the city's position to improve quality of life for New Yorkers. New York City knows that now and in the future, quality of life will be influenced by technology access. New York City is committed to bringing about digital equity and we now have the pieces in place to do just that. I thank you for the opportunity to discuss broadband connectivity and the city's new approach to this critical issue. Thanks again. I just wanna jump in. We've been uh, joined by council member Kalman Yeager. Thank you. We will now turn to testimony from the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. And as a reminder, a Q&A of these panelists from the administration will follow this testimony. Mr. Pastor, you may begin when ready. Good afternoon, Chairs Moya and Holden and Public Advocate Williams and members of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises and the Committee on Technology. My name is Michael Pastor. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Legal Affairs and Franchises and General Counsel, Citywide IT, for the Department of Inf Information Technology and Telecommunications, also known as DOIT. While DOIT does not handle citywide broadband strategy, our franchise authority is a crucial mechanism in bringing broadband, broadband providers to the city. I'm here today to discuss the authorizing resolution before the committees and the immediate tangible steps we are taking to increase internet access across the five boroughs. 
Pre-considered resolution T-2020-6730, a proposed authorizing resolution submitted by the mayor pursuant to section 363 of the city charter for the granting of franchises for the provision of telecommunication services is especially important as it relates to broadband and establishing a reliable source of revenue in these uncertain times. The last authorizing resolution for information services franchises expired in 2018. The companies who are granted information services franchises typically install and operate fiber optic cable in city streets for the purpose of offering voice data and or business to business internet service across the five boroughs. This form of franchise brings in approximately 7 million in annual revenue from 20 different companies. The council's timely attention to this provides considerable benefit to the city. First, we will be able to enter into contracts with both current franchisees and new entrants, maintaining and expanding a steady stream of income, which is particularly important during a fiscal crisis. By expanding the number of participants, this authorizing resolution will increase economic development and competition for enterprise broadband offerings. This lays the groundwork for New York City to expand residential broadband provider options, the importance of which has become even more apparent since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. With this authorizing resolution in place in concert with pending state legislation sponsored by State Senator Parker and supported by Mayor de Blasio, do it would be able to immediately solicit proposals for additional residential broadband franchises to bridge the digital divide and drive down residential broadband prices, all while generating millions in new revenue to New York City. Once again, thank you for the committees. Th thank you to the committees for their diligence and attention to this important resolution. I'm happy to answer any council members' questions at this time. Great, thank you. Um, thank you both uh, for uh, your testimony today. Just a, a couple of questions um, before I turn it over to uh, Chair Holden and, and the rest of my colleagues. Uh, uh, Mr. Farmer, I, I want to go back uh, and talk a little bit about the, the master plan here. Um, so in the master plan uh, that was released in January uh, by your office, one of the, the plans was to coordinate uh, the city's process in preparation for its universal solicitation of broadband. Uh, the plan included uh, starting on uh, its coordination uh, during the first quarter of 2020. What specific activities um, has the coordination included? Uh, how is this coordination uh, progressing? And then if it's not complete, I would just want to get into uh, a little bit of uh, what that phase would look like. Yep, you got on, sorry. Yep. Can we unmute Mr. Farmer? Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Uh, so Moya, thank you for the question. Um, yes, in the interim master plan, we commit uh, to, to four actions, the first of which is coordinating city processes. And we began doing that immediately. Uh, that involves over a dozen different agencies that are participating in a variety of ways. Uh, some are providing expertise, others are providing some of their assets. When we talk about these real estate assets that the city controls all over the city, uh, they're, they're controlled by a number of different agencies. And so having them at the table, participating, um, producing the, the inventory of uh, the real estate assets that they have in which boroughs is really important. And I mentioned in my testimony, the, the digital tool that will allow both respondents, but also reviewers to see uh, that 50,000 foot view of the city where these assets exist and where they can be maximized, their, their impact um, in terms of service delivery can be maximized and improved. So that's, uh, that's all progress that has happened since the release of the interim master plan in January. Um, of course, the arrival of, uh, of COVID, both the healthcare crisis as well as the economic crisis uh, led us to, to reassess and to think about um, how exactly we follow up on, um, on the master plan itself. And one of the things that happened was we, uh, we focused first on the rapid response RFEI with NYCHA in particular. And that was something that we hadn't necessarily planned on doing, but it was a clear need, a clear opportunity, a group that was 
particularly underconnected and particularly vulnerable given the, the, the nature of the crisis. And so we focused on that first. Uh, that is now in the final stages of, of licensing and agreement, and we expect we will announce those shortly. Um, since then, we've now been focusing on the rest, the bigger picture, where we actually bring these assets together from multiple different agencies uh, and, and put those out. And so when you ask about what remains to be done, we believe we're in the final stages of uh, what we're referring to now as the RFP, but you could think of as that universal solicitation for broadband. Uh, and we're in the final stages of uh, ironing out the details on that and expect that to be out shortly. Got it. Um, you talked about the RF RFP a little bit, but I wanna go back to uh, the RFI. We understand that part of the master plan that's in process is similar to the RFI. Was the RFI issued and when? So the RFEI was issued, uh, Re Request for Expressions of Interest was issued uh, by EDC in conjunction with NYCHA. The review committee from the multiple agencies participated uh, in that uh, once we got the responses. The responses were very inspiring in terms of proving out the, the theory that was proposed in the Internet Master Plan itself. We received 30 responses to, to this opportunity. It was only open for a matter of six weeks. In those six weeks, 30 responses, uh, multiple responses have been identified to move forward into licensing. And that's what we, we hope to be able to announce in the near future. So it was, it was uh, 30, you said 30 companies or applicants had submitted. Uh, and is that information available uh, to the public? That's a good question. If we have the identities of the, um, of the respondents available, it ranges from big incumbents, uh, names people are familiar with, small startups people might not have heard of, and even community groups. I will check and see whether that has been made public or will be made public in the near future and get back to you. That'd be great, just so we know where we can find it if we have sure. it. Now, you, you, you talked uh, a lot about uh, NYCHA, um, and we know that the city invested in the project that would provide 10,000 uh, NYCHA seniors with uh, free internet uh, connection, uh, T-Mobile tablets uh, to connect families and friends digitally. Uh, what were uh, what were the NYCHA developments that were covered uh, and how did you choose them? So the NYCHA developments covered specifically in the, the RFEI, is that, do I understand the question correctly? No, so with, would the city invested in the project that would provide 10,000 nights to seniors with free oh, right, internet. right. Yes. Uh, with T-Mobile, you guys did the tablets, you know, yeah. all that. So what were the nights of developments that were covered? Uh, how did you choose them? What devices were distributed? Certainly, certainly. The devices, pretty straightforward. They're LG tablets uh, connected yeah. via T-Mobile. And we started with the NYCHA developments that are in the neighborhoods that have been most heavily impacted uh, by COVID. This was happening in, in late spring and re we really wanted to focus first and foremost on, on health and the need to keep people safe, especially those who are most vulnerable. Um, we, we didn't focus on specific developments by name, but based on where they were located. And we focused on seniors living alone. So if somebody, if an older adult uh, had a family, uh, would be more likely to have people who could help them, assist them, make sure they had their groceries, et cetera. We decided that wasn't the place that was the absolute highest need. So we focused on seniors living alone, whether they were individuals or, or couples, for instance. Um, what we found was that we were able to go outside of the uh, initial target areas. So we ended up delivering tablets to 288 different NYCHA developments around the city. I think that's about 90% of the overall number. So uh, across all five boroughs in almost every NYCHA development, older adults have received these tablets and have received the digital inclusion support that goes along with them. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna stick with this for a minute. Uh, so is, is their browsing history collected? Uh, is their browsing history collected? When we deliver these tablets, they are, the property of the recipients. And so the city does not have an ongoing role as an intermediary uh, providing uh, internet service or, or monitoring uh, their behaviors. Um, it's, it's impossible for me to say that their browsing history is not collected because if they choose to use certain 
services from certain companies that are broadly available that probably many of us uh, use on a regular basis, um, then that, that may be the case. What we wanted to make sure is that these seniors did not have uh, an inferior level of protections to the general population. So we made sure that we were not putting them in a position where their data would be collected and sold, that there would be some intermediary uh, uh, that would be uh, doing something that we deemed to be exploitative. We wanna make sure that this project adhered to those five principles that I mentioned that are really foundational to how we view expanding uh, fair and equitable internet access across the city. So you said that, 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 this, is their that this is their device. Uh, do they need to return the device for any reason? Uh, they do not, no. We, um, we wanted to make sure that this um, really served the role of, of putting these devices into the hands of older adults who, who generally did not have them already. And because we've seen how quickly society has transformed to digital first, whether you're ordering groceries, visiting your doctor, whatever it might be, we wanted to make sure that these seniors had an ability to do that. And the stories that we've heard have been uh, rather inspiring, the anecdotes about seniors being able to connect with family and loved ones, being able to keep an update on uh, family members who are in the hospital and understand what was going on without exposing themselves to risk and danger. Got it. And, and lastly on this, uh, according to the uh, NYCHA journal, uh, Oates held six sessions of the digital literacy classes, including one in Spanish. Uh, 89 NYCHA seniors participated in the first class uh, in addition to the five-week course, uh, Oates also, ha also held one-day workshops that 798 seniors participated in, including getting to know your tablet, an introduction to Zoom, uh, an intro to Spotify, and the, um, and the morning stretch. So 10,000 devices uh, connected to the internet were distributed, uh, yet only 89 users attended a class and only 798 attended the workshop. Uh, is that correct? Uh, I'd have to check with Oates to confirm those numbers are correct, uh, since those I think were collected by that, that article that you mentioned and not by us directly. But assuming they are, I think what's important to note is that those are just a subset of the interactions. Every recipient of the tablet has been contacted directly by Oates on an individual basis and has been offered the opportunity to engage in whatever forms of engagement they right. feel like they need. Right, but that only makes up seven... 0.9% uh, of the overall population here. Most seniors are not, uh, uh, their, their literacy and technology is not a thing here, right? Like they're the ones that actually need that training. Um, so we're, we're talking uh, a very limited amount. Uh, 9,000 and change uh, are still remaining out there. So I'm, I'm just curious to know what steps are being done uh, to uh, connect with these folks, uh, because to me, that's a very low percentage of people that are actually um, getting connected uh, with these important classes on how to use uh, the internet and their devices. I, I appreciate your, um, your thinking about this issue because it's a really important one. What we found is that there's a, a variety of levels of comfort and experience with technology among the, these 10,000 recipients. And, uh, and some are fairly comfortable already, have used devices maybe owned by their family in the past and feel comfortable and don't feel the need to engage with the offerings from Oats. Others absolutely need it, uh, but ultimately these are, these are partic uh, voluntary participation. And so uh, we're putting opportunities out there. I, I would think that more recipients have benefited from this than are captured in one particular class or even a, a small subset of classes. Uh, some of these conversations that happen one-on-one -on -one can go on for an hour where Oates will answer a lot of questions to that individual. So someone who wasn't in a class may have actually gotten very similar information directly from Oates in, in these thousands of conversations that Oates is handling. Right. Um, and can T-Mobile Oats, LG, can they track these devices? Can they track the devices? Um, I think to answer the question, we need to talk about under what circumstances. So if a device is reported missing, for instance, um, there are ways to tell which IP address uh, a signal is coming from. So um, I think ultimately 
these devices are not treated any differently from other devices that are out there in the marketplace. And that's really important that we want to make sure that people are treated um, you know, with respect and dignity and, and given devices that they could choose how to use. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna switch over to, to, to Michael uh, from Do It. Thank you, Mr. Farmer, for, for your questions, uh, for, your, for answering my questions. Uh, Michael, good to see you. Uh, thank you for see your time you today. Uh, I'm sticking with NYCHA right now. So uh, I wanted to come to you and ask you uh, how many uh, NYCHA community computer centers uh, have been implemented uh, and at which NYCHA developments? Do you know that? I, I do not have that information uh, at the ready, uh, council member. I, I'm happy to look into that. I, I do not, uh, that not that particular program uh, is not in my, my individual purview, but I'm happy to look into it and get back to you with the data. If you could, because this is, this is really important for, for us here, you know, like we need a lot of answers. Are the, uh, are the uh, centers up and running? Uh, you know, who funds these centers? A lot of this all interconnects with what sort of the city is trying to say that they're doing and the mayor's office trying to say that they're really moving ahead with helping uh, uh, NYCHA uh, seniors and all this, and we, we really need to have uh, these answers. So I, I know you'll get back to us on that. Uh, it, that's that's really critical for us. Um, Absolutely. So let me let me move on to the next one then. Uh, how does the internet connection provided by uh, an information service differ from the internet connection that's provided by uh, the cable uh, TV companies? So generally speaking, it doesn't, council member. So internet, uh, an internet connection from via an inter information services franchise, which is the subject of our resolution, provides internet to the residents of the, or the business getting it. Uh, currently, the cable companies also provide internet service through their infrastructure uh, to the homes and to the residences that they have. Uh, but uh, the goal of the authorizing resolution is to expand the providers who are in this business providing internet service, uh, using the fiber that's in the street to come up with new um, options for residences and businesses. Um, once that happens, if that happens, uh, the people who are tap into those new services will get the same internet service that we are all accustomed to uh, getting most prototypically through uh, through what we think of as the cable companies who also provide internet service to to many most of us in the city at our homes. Right. And, and what is the range uh, of types of customers and the sizes of the businesses who are utilizing the services of information service uh, franchises? So the information services portfolio now is focused largely on uh, commercial entities that are either large enterprises or mid-sized enterprises, generally speaking. Another goal of, of the authorizing resolution, if we were to get it adopted by the council and proceed with new franchises with these companies, would be to expand competition within the commercial uh, market uh, and therefore maybe give some new offerings, uh, options to small businesses as well, uh, and, and then to residences. So the current portfolio is mostly focused on uh, the provision of internet service to uh, large and mid-sized enterprises with, through the city. And uh, whose purview is this uh, for the... Uh... Um, for the internet services? That's, that's do it. Uh, that's a franchise purview. Yes, indeed. And, and those, uh, those companies that are providing the service are providing it pursuant to franchise agreements that have expired. Uh, and so part of the impetus behind coming to uh, the council is uh, we want to sort of re-engage you know, one classic sort of do it charter power is our power to enter into franchise agreements. And right now, because of the expiration of the prior um, resolution, we can't re-engage with that cadre of companies and with potential new companies uh, with a new franchise agreement that would be better for the city. Got it. And, and so uh, the purview for the uh, NYCHA community uh, computer programs, who, who, what, where, who, who falls under that? So I'm going to have to check for you, council member. So in, in, in do it space, uh, we focus on all of the all of the franchises, which are uh, the provision of telecommunication services by using our public rights of way. So that's uh, the mobile telecom franchises, um, cable franchises, information services franchises and the public communication services franchises for Wi Fi, all of those things. They come to do it, do it enters into franchise agreements. I don't happen to know offhand who oversees the NYCHA uh, community centers uh, in terms of the technology that's there and um, uh, 
uh, and who sort of oversees the program. It, it's not, to my knowledge, a do-it program, um, but I'm happy to look into it for you. Great. Um, so can, can information services franchise provide broadband services to residential customers or no? So that's the goal of this resolution. Right now, if you have a um, information services franchisee who wants to do that, uh, there's this degree of uncertainty about whether they can do that because they don't have a franchise with the city and there sort of isn't that mechanism in place. So we think the, the gating item here uh, is the authorizing resolution, give us the power to enter into franchises um, and, and then they could do that. Okay, so uh, the, the cable uh, companies are required to provide a service to every household uh, in their franchise areas. Information service franchisees are only required to run wires in uh, fulfillment of customer orders. Uh, what incentives are there for uh, the information services uh, to serve, uh, to service residential customers? And what barriers uh, to enter uh, inhabit like information service franchisees from providing residential broadband uh, services themselves. So council member Moya, I mean, one of the barriers you normally would face is that it would be costly to put the fiber in the place to get the fiber there to then offer the service to a customer. Because a lot of these companies already have fiber in the street, but they don't have this franchise mechanism. That is a barrier. Like I, to answer your second question, I think it was, I mean, the lack of the franchise authority is a form of a barrier in terms of incentives. When we look, and, 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 and John can speak to this as well, when we look at the offerings of the incumbent cable ISPs, I'm not going to be shattering any, uh, I'm not going to be breaking any news to say those offerings are very expensive. Uh, and so the incentive, so the bar breaking through the barrier is using the fiber that's there. The incentive is to undercut and say there are customers, millions of customers in the city who may want to get internet at lower rates. Uh, you can pull those customers away. That's your financial incentive to do it. Okay. And how big is the market um, for, for uh, this uh, by the existing uh, service franchisees to join uh, to uh, like, so kind of like where, where, where is, where is this um, uh, like the market for, for them? Uh, how is it here in New York City? Uh, so the way I would answer that, council member, and tell me if I'm not being responsive. I mean, th there are 8.5 million, you know, people in the city of New York, and then more who come in to work. Um, all of those people are getting internet in one way or the other. Uh, so I think, you know, the market is for all of those customers, if, if there are opportunities for competition. In addition, there are places where at homes where the, the home, the residence only has one internet option at all, literally just one. If they want to connect, they only have one option. Uh, and so that is the market as well. I mean, I think we think the market of is, is the sort of entire, you know, population of the city plus the businesses that rely on internet service. It's a pretty big. So, so ha having, you know, knowing that it's pretty big, uh, how does do it expect uh, this market to grow in 10 years? So we have never pro prognosticated to that degree. Uh, but what I will say, council member, is that there are, you know, there are 20 companies already there that are in the street providing these services to commercial um, customers. So that's, that's 20 potential uh, customers right there. Um, I think, you know, in an ideal world, if we get this uh, authorizing resolution, if we get the state legislative fix I referenced in my testimony, which we can speak again about if it comes up, um, we would expect ro robust competition uh, to flow in uh, for people to take advantage of the fiber that they have in place, uh, maybe even for new entrants to come in as well. Um, and I think that in 10 years, you, know, you could see a much better competitive landscape than you do now. That would be the goal. Got it. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip really quick um, down here because I want to give a um, uh, Council member holding some time as well. But I, I, we have to talk about uh, net neutrality a little bit here. Uh, I can't let that go without us having a, a, a deep dive into this. Uh, we know that the cable television industry has uh, aggressively lobbied uh, to get the Trump administration to reverse the net neutrality, neutrality policies uh, of, uh, of President Obama's administration. Uh, net neutrality prohibits internet service providers from prioritizing content uh, based on fees paid by publishers. Uh, in essence, is it a policy that requires uh, 
it is, in essence, it's a policy that requires internet service providers to offer their services uh, with neutrality with respect to the content and economic power of the publisher. Uh, having said that, what is the administration's position on net neutrality? And uh, would including net neutrality requirements in all franchises uh, related to the internet services uh, be uh, a good policy? So what I would say is, I'm sorry, John, did you wanna? I think John may wanna start. Thank, thank you, I appreciate that. Having trouble un unmuting myself again. Um, so I'm gonna pass it to Michael in just a second uh, to discuss the franchises, but broadly speaking, um, the administration, the city are very much in favor of net neutrality. Uh, several years ago, the mayor signed the mayor's pledge uh, and brought other mayors around the country on board to pledge to support net neutrality. We, uh, as a city, uh, the mayor's office CTO do it, uh, have uh, submitted uh, comments to the FCC on multiple occasions in support of net neutrality. So I think it's just important to note there's a very clear position here citywide. Uh, Michael, if you'd like to speak specifically to the franchises. Uh, thanks, John. So right, so what I totally in agreement with the policy net neutrality, very problematic thing. The problem has been accentuated by COVID, right? Like our reliance on the internet connection and, and what that means for us has us thinking about our interface. Um, so just from the franchise perspective, uh, I would add council member, uh, in the area of information services, we think there might be a window uh, to uh, potentially uh, pursue some net neutrality protections in these information services franchises, something that we're still evaluating. I don't want to set it in stone, uh, but I, I think you had the question, is that something we could, could, could pursue in the information services franchise agreements? And we are sort of actively evaluating that possibility. Right. Uh, and just, just to tell and, and inform the public, who would benefit from uh, a net neutrality provision uh, in all information services uh, franchise agreements uh, and why? Okay, just getting on, unmuted there. Uh, so the people who would benefit would be the people who get their internet service from that franchisee. Uh, the risk with net neutrality is that your uh, consumption um, uh, can be, you, you could either be slowed in trying to access certain information you want, or you could be, there could be preferences in terms of what you want. So if you think about it, the way we interface with the, you know, the internet now, that that's a real, a real problem. So they would benefit. I don't know, John, if you want to speak to I think that's benefits. exactly right. It's generally net neutrality benefits consumers and it makes sure that consumers are treated fairly. It makes sure that they have choice, that they can choose what content to engage with, that they can do that on a level playing field, that small companies, small businesses that might be homegrown here in New York have an opportunity to compete on a level playing field with the folks who are already, already there. Um, a, a couple of things I just want to add on to, because I know they've been brought up and I was, I was stuck on mute. In terms of um, the personal computing centers, there are 508 of those around the city and, and Chair Moya, you brought up rightly so, how are we using these assets that are so important in normal times during 2020. Uh, we're working closely with agencies that administer these centers because some are, are libraries, some are cornerstones uh, administered by uh, DYCD. Uh, others are, are DIFTA focused on, on older adults. Those senior centers um, for older adults in particular, we are working closely with DIFTA on a digital strategy for the agency to think about how now and in the future, they've got the ability to deliver so many of these services that traditionally are done in person and do that online in a way that's effective and meets their, uh, their audience where it is. Got it. And, and to your knowledge, uh, does the information service providers uh, have any valid objections uh, to including such a provision? Uh, I can think of none. Got it. So the information service providers, you know, they may argue uh, that uh, they serve as businesses who have been uh, negotiating power to select uh, the quality of their internet services. Uh, is there anything preventing information service providers from providing internet access to residential households and to individuals uh, who do not have the bargaining power uh, to ensure that the content that they generate uh, will have the same access to the internet as their corporate clients. 
I, I, I can't think of any. I, I think I would, I would answer that question in a way, Council Member, by you know, looking at sort of what the federal government did in a prior administration, looking at this in depth, identifying the problem, weighing this and saying, no, we, we want net neutrality to be something that, that is, is codified and protected. And that's been reversed, of course. Uh, I, I, if I could just go back to your, your earlier question, Council Member, which I answered quickly, um, I think what I would, I would flip it in a way and to say, how, how can we really tolerate any other thing? Meaning if, if my means of connecting to the internet, my family's means of connecting to the internet and how I'm accessing information and reading things could be influenced by the speed at which I can get something, it's just not an acceptable end state. And if I may, Chair Moy, I'd like to add that there, ISPs are not a monolith. And so while there may be some that uh, are, are against net neutrality, there are others, particularly many smaller ones that have advocated openly for it. So, but like just, these are the last two that I'm following up with here on, on net neutrality. Uh, based on how net neutrality was uh, implemented during the Obama administration, and, and Michael, you were kind of getting to this, but you jumped back. What conclusions can be drawn about the impact net neutrality has on the proliferation of residential broadband internet access? John, I think may I'll let you take take that one or I'll, I can go. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, the impact on residential broadband internet access. I, honestly, I don't know specific studies that have come out conclusively with, with any particular uh, correlation there or causality there. Um, I can, I'm happy to check with my, my staff and, and get back to you to see if they're aware of anything that I haven't seen. And then just who, lastly, this is it guys, thank you. Uh, who benefits from the reversal of uh, net neutrality rules uh, and what impact does that have on residential broadband customers? So I can start, large corporations uh, benefit, uh, large ISPs can, can create a new revenue stream here, um, make money off of it. Uh, large businesses that can pay for preferential treatment will also benefit. So it's something that really will diminish uh, the ability for smaller players to compete and will diminish the choice that individual consumers have uh, to, to identify the, you know, the, the businesses, the information uh, that, they wanna, that they wanna get. Right. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, John. Thank you, Michael, for uh, your testimony today. Uh, thank you, Bob, uh, for your patience. Uh, I wanna turn it over to uh, uh, Chair Holden. Uh, thank you, Chair Moya, and uh, I'm going to try to limit my questions so that other council members can ask uh, some questions, but uh, I just want to direct this to Mr. Farmer. Uh, in May of 2014, I know you weren't here yet, but uh, Mayor de Blasio gave a keynote address at an Internet Week conference where he committed to expanding broadband, uh, broadband access across the city, arguing that affordable high-speed Internet is crucial to the city's growing tech sector and to tackling economic uh, inequality. Uh, he was quoted in the New York Observer then as saying, our approach is going to be bold and it's going to be decisive because we simply haven't done enough in this city. A goal, uh, the goal, he said, is quite simple. We must have universal, affordable, high-speed internet access throughout this city. Uh, it's as simple as that, he said. Broadband is essential for everything this community needs to do. It's essential for everything we need to do to be fair, be a fair and just city. Because we, he said, because we can't continue to have the digital divide that holds us back, um, that holds back so many citizens. So uh, a lot of, you know, Mr. Farmer, a lot has happened in the world in the six plus years that have passed. For example, the newspaper he was quoted in, The Observer, uh, has ceased print publication. But more importantly, the coronavirus pandemic showed just how right the mayor was at the time and how critical broadband access is. Uh, in April 2015, Maya Wiley, then counsel to Mayor de Blasio, was tasked with, the leading, with leading the efforts of expanding universal access to the internet. Yet the administration seems to have done very little, if anything, to show uh, uh, on this pledge, to show for itself on this pledge. It seems to be that it's another one of the mayor's many promises that are not being delivered. Can you tell me what progress your office has made on this critical initiative in the past six years, other than a master plan report? 
How many households have access to broadband as a result of the efforts of this administration? Well, thank you, Chair Holden, for your engagement on this issue. And you are uh, correct in saying that this is incredibly important, that the administration realized that. And that's why it was highlighted early on in the administration. In the ensuing years, a number of actions were taken. Uh, one of the most high profile is connecting Queensbridge houses, the largest public housing development in North America. And there, 7,000 New Yorkers, thousands of households uh, are connected today. And what we've seen there is adoption rates that rival the wealthiest parts of New York City. And so we know that in high poverty areas, adoption rates are, are roughly half, roughly. And in the highest income parts of the city, they're over 90%. Well, now today in Queensbridge, usage of the internet that's available there is over 90%. So we've done a number of things. We've shown that indeed this is a, an affordability issue at its core. And that's something that frankly was still being debated a few years ago. And the evidence is clear now that that's not the case. You go beyond the residents of Queensbridge themselves who've been connected. You look at the programs that we've put in place for 10,000 older adults, programs that the Department of Education has put in place for uh, over 300,000 school kids to receive uh, tablets. Um, and when you talk about what we've learned there that has informed the Internet Master Plan. The Internet Master Plan didn't just come out of, out of the blue. Uh, it is, has received praise from nationally recognized experts in the space because it's so responsive to the reality. It recognizes that there is no silver bullet. And lots of cities have tried to find that silver bullet, that one, that one deal they could strike that would just solve the problem and make it go away. Uh, that's been tried here in New York too, and it hasn't worked. And so instead, we've got a portfolio approach that invites in the private sector, big companies, small companies, community groups, identifies the roles that government itself is uniquely suited to play, and envisions how this will all work going forward. And to your point of what's happened, I think you just need to look at what's happened in recent months. In recent months with the RFEI uh, for NYCHA residents, and the fact that we are on the cusp, uh, we don't have exact numbers yet, but we're on the cusp of what I expect to be tens of thousands of households getting connected in the very near future. And when the RFP comes out, we're aiming to connect hundreds of thousands. And so that's, that's change at scale. And to your point of uh, it didn't come overnight. It took a, a lot of work and a lot of effort and a lot of uh, consultation with experts, with community groups, uh, pilot projects. A lot of work went into this over the years to get us to where we are right now. And where we are right now, I just wanna be really clear, we're not in the same place as a society as we were three, five, 10, 15 years ago. We're on the cusp of a transformation because the next generation of connectivity is going to require a, a larger amount, a densification of the equipment in our built environment. And so now is the time for us to focus on closing this digital divide doing it in consultation with community groups, ensuring that as 5G, for instance, becomes more and more of a reality in our city, we have both uh, the ability to lead the way in terms of our central business district, but also our business districts in every borough, making sure that small businesses have world-class, high-quality connectivity, and that individuals, including those who haven't been connected in the past, can also benefit from that. Okay. Well, uh, in, let me, let's talk about the RFP, though. Uh, in 2017, the administration got around to releasing the request for information to the tech community, uh, the response to which were intended to shape the direction and form of the administration's broadband implementation. The request for information was intended to inform, inform the, the basis of the RFP. That was three years ago. What's the holdup in issuing the RFP? Should it really take, uh, Mr. Farmer, three years to draft? So I, I can't speak to the exact numbers that you're referring to. Uh, a lot of the research and drafting happened in the course of 2019. Uh, and I was here for a large portion of that. Um, prior to that, the work had begun. I'm not sure about 2017, but certainly in late 2018, it was well underway. And that involved over 50 consultations with various types of stakeholders. It involved bringing on consultants with expertise in uh, broadband technology, in digital equity, in uh, large infrastructure projects, bringing that all together 
Uh, and again, assessing the value of different pilot projects here in New York and elsewhere to inform what should be done. Um, it, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, if we look back on it, perhaps we could find some places where we could have tightened up that time frame. But in reality, we produced uh, a groundbreaking document, one that has been hailed as the best in the country. Um, and we did that in January. Uh, and I think it's worth noting that by March, everybody saw just how important connectivity is. Back in January, there were still a number of people saying, well, this is, you know, this is a luxury. And why isn't it okay for us to say, you have to be able to afford a certain amount of money per month, otherwise you don't get it. And everybody saw in the springtime here in New York City, we all saw it, that this went from being something that we could argue is morally right. It's the right thing to do for people and families who couldn't afford it. It's a public health issue. You know, my neighbor down the block not being able to afford broadband becomes a, a public health issue for every other family on that block. To make sure that people can get their services online, their medications online, visit a doctor online, became an absolute necessity. And, and we're not going back. We've seen the amount of digital transformation that's occurred in recent months, and it's just all the more important. So I wanna just highlight the fact that the plan came out prior to the, the clarity that everyone now has about just how essential broadband is. Yeah, I'm not, I'm again, again, I know you weren't here, but finally this summer, after nearly seven years of promising universal broadband, the mayor announced an accelerated internet uh, master plan to accelerate broadband build out across uh, all five boroughs, including, like you mentioned, $157 million investment in ending digital redlining. Uh, the press release says, this investment will extend new internet service options the 600,000 underserved New Yorkers, including 200,000 NYCHA residents over the next 18 uh, months. However, the mayor promised that the city would announce the partnership by the end of the summer of 2020, uh, this year, with full deployment of the program occurring throughout 2020 and 2021. Well, summer's over, and I haven't seen an announcement at any partnership or an RFP. If you, Mr. Farmer, if you're behind already, how do you plan to meet your commitment to providing low cost broadband access to 600,000 New Yorkers by the end of next year, mainly because your office has been promising this. And again, not only you, but the administration has been promising this to New Yorkers for the past seven years. Well, I appreciate the question and I appreciate the urgency that you feel because let me assure you that uh, we in the administration feel it as well. Uh, we want to get this done as soon as humanly possible. Uh, we have to recognize that this is an approach that is, is new. It's brand new, not just here in New York City. It's something where there is not a model for this particular approach to closing the digital divide. And so we've had to deal with uh, that complexity. And we have made a ton of progress that I can assure you uh, has been made behind the scenes, even though you might not have seen the results yet. And as I mentioned during my testimony, we are on the verge and, uh, and look forward to relatively soon announcing the initial impact of uh, NYCHA residents, uh, thousands and thousands of NYCHA residents benefiting from this approach. We still are on track for 2021 to be the year in which uh, substantial at scale progress is made in the city. And uh, if, if indeed that changes, I will let you know. But as of now, I can assure you that 2021 uh, is still on track to be the year in which uh, substantial change is made. Yeah, we, but we've heard, like, you got to admit, though, we've heard this over the seven-year period. So that's why I'm very, very skeptical. But hopefully with you on board, um, we might uh, have some progress. But what is the technical approach uh, you plan to take to give the, these 600,000 New Yorkers low-cost or no-cost broadband access? Um, how, for instance, how are you planning to spend the, the 157 million that the mayor has put at your disposal? Yeah, that's a that's an excellent question, and the solicitation that will be going out has uh, has has multiple parts that are described in the Internet Master Plan itself. So one part is the need for infrastructure, because in recent decades, a substantial amount of infrastructure has been built in New York City. We we have a lot of uh, fiber, for instance, that is incredibly valuable, a lot of it being used, some of it not really being fully used right now. Um, but there is underinvestment in certain neighborhoods. It's the neighborhoods that we know are, are generally uh, lower income neighborhoods that are majority minority neighborhoods. 
these are the parts of the city that have been left behind that today have the fewest options, today have the least amount of infrastructure in them. And so we need to focus there. We need to level the playing field so the entire city uh, really can participate fully. It's not just the infrastructure, though. It's also the, the equipment that's needed. And this is where the city's real estate assets come into play and can be so valuable. We can maximize uh, how we utilize rooftops and poles and rooms and buildings, all these things that are controlled by the city uh, all over in every borough. And so by inviting in participants from the private sector, partners, whether it be small companies or big companies, inviting them in to tell us what technologies they think are appropriate in which particular neighborhoods, uh, given the, the customer base that they envision, given the built environment, some neighborhoods in New York City, very tall buildings, other very uh, low lying, other you got a, a mix. And so in different places, you might need uh, a wired approach In other places, fixed wireless might be appropriate. And this is a, again, a type of technology that really wasn't uh, broadly thought of and broadly available even uh, a certain number of years ago, but today it is. So the internet master plan envisions being flexible enough to respond to the proposals that come from the experts outside of government. Now we internally will have the ability to vet that, review that, ensure that what's being proposed really does make sense. And then as it does, we expect to see a mix of technological approaches uh, to solve these problems. So some of them uh, will be more intensive in terms of the infrastructure they require, others much less so. And that's going to just depend on the neighborhood, on what infrastructure is already in place, what the built environment looks like, and what those proposals look like from the private sector. Okay, uh, thanks, Mr. Farmer. Thank you, uh, Chamoy. I'm going to uh, cut my some of the second part of my questions off or do it and, and let, give some of my colleagues the uh, chance to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Holden. Um, I want to uh, acknowledge that we've been joined by uh, Council Member uh, Richards uh, as well. So I, I'm going to I'm going to turn it over uh, to my uh, colleagues uh, who have questions. I'm just taking it by the order in which it was received. So I want to turn it over right now to uh, Council Member Lansman for some questions. I just want to make some um, administrative remarks. So I, I will call on Council Members to ask questions in order they have used the Zoom raise hand function and Council Members please please keep your questions to three minutes, including responses. If there is a second round of questioning, please council, council member questions will be limited to two minutes. A, a surgeon at ARM will keep a timer and let you know when your time is up. And now I'm turning over to council member Lanzman. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, good afternoon. Um, First, let me just cl uh, clarify a couple of things. Um, this uh, resolution would not result in an RFP that would result in a franchise that would cover uh, Spectrum, Altice, or Verizon's provision of broadband services, right? Those are covered in their existing cable TV franchise agreements? That is correct, Council Member. Okay. Um, so, briefly, what is the status of those franchise agreements. My understanding is that they've expired. Um, when are we going to be presented with a resolution to consider for uh, renewing uh, uh, that franchise, for an RFP for those franchises? Yes, uh, council members, so you're correct. That, so those, those have expired. The status of the three franchises are what's called holdover status, which means that all of the provisions and the agreements remain in effect, outlasting the expiration. Uh, we have not uh, uh, proceeded in conjunction with the law department to transmit to the council an authorizing resolution uh, for the for the council's review for renewal there uh, because there is active litigation over an FCC order that seeks to cut quite significantly uh, if it were upheld uh, into um, the locality's ability to get uh, uh, revenue uh, from the cable companies. So with that looming over uh, us, uh, you know, we kind of thought that it made sense to let that litigation uh, re resolve. Uh, the status of that case, to the extent you were going to ask, is that it's in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in Cincinnati. Uh, it will be shortly fully briefed or has been fully briefed, and then I think there'll be oral arguments, so we'd expect a decision uh, soon. Uh, but that's sort of where the status is right now. So, um, you know, the, the two chairs have done a very good job about talking about access to, to, to broadband 
Um, I want to talk about the, the resolution specifically, and I want to talk about what has been, in my view, the city's failure to live up to the letter and the spirit of the city charter, particularly section 363, which relates to requiring that our franchisees, our cable franchisees, our, our, our broadband franchisees, um, honor and recognize collective bargaining agreements. For nearly four years now, uh, Spectrum workers have been on strike. There have been numerous um, examples of a Spectrum not negotiating in good faith. And in fact, accusations that I find very credible um, of Spectrum acting in bad faith. And so what is going to be different in these RFPs, in, in this RFP, in the franchise agreements that result from this RFP, that is going to give the city more teeth and more ability to enforce the provision of the city charter. I'm inspired. Thank you. That requires franchisees to honor both the, the, in my view, not just the law, but the spirit of, of uh, collective and bargaining agreements uh, from their workers. And, and if there isn't anything that's going to be different in this franchise agreement for, for broadband services than there exists in the franchise agreement for cable TV services, I don't see how I could possibly vote um, to authorize that uh, for that authorizing resolution. Sure, council member. So I think that with respect to the cable franchises, I mean, every time a new authorizing resolution comes up, it's an opportunity to look and to determine are there ways in which uh, the city and the, count, the council and the administration can be more aggressive. And I think that's an opportunity we'd be willing to take on uh, with you. Um, with, with respect to the entire world of labor provisions, you know, federal law kind of kick, keeps localities out in terms of their powers in this area. But I will say that um, what is different now for the mobile telecom franchises, which, which we hope to make different for the information services franchises and ultimately cable, is with the mobile telecom franchises, we got in place a sort of um, really advanced reporting uh, requirement to the mobile telecom franchisees that will for the first time give do it data about how the workforce is treated by those franchisees, which we didn't have before, it's appendix H, appendix H to our agreement. That is something we would want to advance uh, as well uh, with the information services franchisees uh, and, and ultimately with the cable companies as well, with the idea being like, at the very least, uh, we, should be, we, we should be pushing to know more, to demand more information uh, from uh, these entities about their labor practices and then utilize that information in whatever way the city writ large Well, I'm just going to conclude by saying um, I would need to see the language that the city intends to put in the RFP and the language that the city intends to put in the franchise agreement itself and to assure myself that the city is using the maximum authority allowable under federal law um, to be able to hold franchisees to the letter and spirit of our own city charter when it comes to honoring uh, collective bargaining agreements uh, in good faith. Thank you and uh, thank you to both the chairs. Thank you, Council Member Lansman. Uh, I now want to uh, turn it over to uh, Council Member Kalos. Time starts now. Uh, thank you to the Tech Committee Chair and Professor Bob Holden. Happy belated birthday, as well as Zoning and Franchises Chair Francisco Moya for leading this hearing on bridging the digital divide. Councilmember Ben Kalos, that's at Ben Kalos on social media and GitHub. Uh, when I went to Bronx Science in 1994, it was one of the few schools on the planet that had an internet connection with two computers for the school, which was a big deal. They had X terminals with a killer app called Mosaic and quite frankly, it changed my life. By 1996, I was building websites with companies like, with big companies like jumbo.com and local insurance agents at State Farm. Uh, now, fast forward to 2015, one in four households in Brooklyn and one in three households in the Bronx were left on the wrong side of the digital divide. As a council member, uh, when Charter sought to purchase Time Warner Cable, I joined then public advocate Tish James to win and to fight for and win $14.99 a month low cost high speed internet 
for low-income children on free or reduced school lunch and seniors receiving supplemental social security. We even uh, got a commitment from charter not to implement data caps and to commit to net neutrality, leaving New York State one of the few jurisdictions with these vital protections, even though we've seen FCC rollbacks. Uh, as of 2018, we've seen households without internet drop down to 22% or lower across the five boroughs. I wanna thank CTO John Paul Farmer for the detailed internet master plan, which I support. I'm gonna focus my question on the fiber franchise before us today to be answered by DOIT Deputy Commissioner Michael Pastor. Uh, first question, the resolution proposed today seeks authorization by reference of what it does not do. In layman's terms, the resolution is for fiber only and uh, those providers and excludes cable and mobile franchises with Charter, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, and Sprint. Is that correct? That's correct. It excludes mobile, cable, and public communication structure franchises. That's right. Can we require fiber franchises to agree to certain labor standards for training, benefits, and wage rate where workers who do this work can actually afford to live in our city? So as I mentioned in the prior question, council member, our ability to require labor standards, to set labor standards is constrained um, uh, by uh, federal law. Uh, so what I mentioned in the prior, uh, to, in response to the prior question is that a, a starting point, I think, uh, is requiring what we've already required with the mobile telecom franchisees, requiring that of the information services franchisees, which is to report in detail from top to bottom their labor practices and give us a new, a new window into that. Perfect. And now the internet master plan notes a connection of fiber and business districts at a time that most every resident is both a school and an office. Can we encourage, uh, encourage and incentivize fiber providers to enter residential neighborhoods to increase competition, improve service, reduce prices for consumers and even offer affordable fiber? So I think uh, sorry. Um, so I think that the, our view of it, the, the goal of the authorizing resolution is to incentivize the utilization of fiber much more broadly than it is now. Uh, because of this lack of franchise program, we think that there's fiber that's not being used in places where it could be used both for commercial and residential customers. Do you support municipal broadband and could we require fiber franchisees to lay strands of fiber for the city? So what I will say is I don't want to speak to municipal broadband more broadly because I sort of focus on the, the franchise portfolio council CGO member. can answer that question. Yep. But so I, I, the master I can answer the question about requiring Eight. the franchisees to lay the fiber. But we're on a clock, so we're, we're going to... You offered my colleague from Queens extra time. I'd love to just get this last question answered, please. It's 14 million people, 10 years. We got it, Ben. Let's... We got to speed it up, though. Yep. I will, I will just quickly right. say that the Internet Master Plan is a flexible document, and it allows for a variety of approaches, uh, approaches uh, and does not in any way uh, rule out municipal broadband. Um, ultimately, it's about getting to the, the end state that we all agree we want. Great. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Council Member. I now uh, want to acknowledge uh, Council Member uh, Levin, who has joined us, uh, but also he is up next uh, to ask uh, a couple of questions. Councilman, I'm sorry. No. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to ask about, um, and I apologize if, if one of my colleagues has already asked this, but um, <clears throat> if we're, how we're able to um, ascertain the, the, the percentage or number of New York City school children who are sign up for remote learning who um, have um, adequate access in their homes or wherever they're living, they might be living in a, in a shelter, um, whether they have uh, adequate um, uh, internet connectivity. I appreciate that question. It's one that's on all of our minds right now, making sure that school children have what they need to learn and that that's not dictated by the zip code they live in or how much money their parents have in the bank. Uh, one of the realities is that the data that exists today is not as granular or as real time as we would like. And that's one of the things that we intend to address uh, going forward. We understand um, from the Department of Education, uh, the students that they have delivered devices to, uh, certainly the Department of Education is monitoring um, usage uh, and ensuring that any complaints of not being able to get online are addressed. 
I think ultimately to get the clarity that you're asking for, the Department of Education itself is probably the best equipped to answer that today. And so uh, if there are opportunities coming up, uh, that might be the right audience for you. Otherwise, I'd be happy to connect you and, and make sure you get those answers. Um, well, what I would like to see is, um, is a framework in place that has uh, your office and do it and the DOE um, working in collaboration, um, not so much to just respond to uh, complaints about lack of connectivity, but um, to proactively um, ensure that, th that these are happening. I mean, we have half a million school kids in New York City um, learning remotely. Um, we have, I don't, you know, I mean, frankly, the Department of Education, you know, is is um, pulled in a in a, uh, a lot of different directions. And so, what I would really like to see is is a you know a master plan for how to ensure that there's um, that there's that there's connectivity uh, for for every school kid. So. Um, you know, that's what I would be looking for is something that's, that's uh, a strategy in place to, to do that. Thank you, council member. And we agree, we have to, as a city, be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We have to be able to address the near term needs as well as look ahead at the medium term. Uh, we've been involved in conversations with the Department of Education. We're fortunate that the department does have a number of highly qualified technologists on staff who have experience working hand in hand with the education policy folks and others within the agency, because ultimately it's not just about whether or not a place is quote unquote connected, it's that do they have the, the type of bandwidth, the speed, the latency that they need to do the type of learning that the school system is, is looking to provide. So those two things really do need to be knitted together. We are certainly uh, always available to, to help them in any way we can. Okay, just just to add to chair, just one last point is um, particularly for children in shelter, there are over 20,000 kids in shelter in New York City. Um, uh, those shelters are uh, contracted mostly to not-for-profits uh, through the De Department for Homeless Services. So um, having um, that relationship with DHS is, is, is very important as well. So I encourage that. Thank you for noting that, uh, council member. That's something that uh, we, we have been involved in those conversations as well. And we, we share your, your urgency and, and uh, the need to make sure that every child, uh, particularly including those who are living in shelters, have what they need to learn online. Great, thank you. Uh, I now want to call on uh, council member Gradenchek. Time starts now. I will, I will need three minutes. Thank you, chairs, um, and thank you for this very, very important hearing. Uh, I wish to associate myself with uh, much of what has been said today, um, uh, that um, broadband is, is uh, no longer a luxury. It's absolutely a necessity in this uh, modern age that we live in, and, and certainly um, during this pandemic where uh, virtually all of us are probably at home today. Um, I see uh, Chair Holden is in his office I'm not sure where um, Chair Moyer is, but um, he may be there as well. And uh, I am home um, as I've been through most of this uh, pandemic. But um, the thing that I, I most want to associate myself with is the comments by uh, my colleague, Rory Lantzman. I am very concerned uh, about uh, provisions for organized labor and for all the employees that work for these companies, uh, particularly uh, those members of Local Who 3 who have been um, basically on the street for almost four years now. And uh, that is due to uh, the unwillingness of um, gets, uh, at Get Spectrum or Spectrum um, to uh, negotiate a fair contract. And uh, I've known the people at Local 3 uh, literally my entire life. And I know uh, that they're reasonable. They understand um, what needs to be done. They've con uh, they have, in many ways, uh, the leadership of Local 3 going back decades um, uh, has invented many of the rights that people in this country uh, take for granted. And so um, I am disappointed. I understand there are constraints by federal law. Um, I'm hoping that those constraints will be removed um, in, in the coming months. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, as, uh, as Councilman Lansman said, I'm going to have to look very, very closely at any resolution 
uh, that should come through uh, this committee, uh, the subcommittee chaired by uh, uh, Councilman Moya. So I thank you uh, both for being here today and I thank the chairs uh, for this very, very necessary and important hearing um, for all the people uh, of New York City and especially those who currently are living without broadband. So thank you both. And uh, with that, I will end my remarks. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. If I, if I may respond uh, to the council members' remarks, because I, I appreciate them, and I just want to make clear that the Internet Master Plan uh, explicitly supports um, uh, the rights of, of workers, and that as we think about how we build out these networks that the city needs now and will need in the future, that is, that is uh, clearly stated as one of the things that we expect to see. And so when we talk about the AR, um, I see, I, I would envision that fitting under that umbrella of the principles that uh, that the interim master plan is, is based on. Thank you, Mr. Farmer. Thank you again, Chairs. Thank you, Barry. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I just wanna make this announcement if it wasn't made earlier. Uh, we're only doing one round of questions right now. Uh, we have a large panel that is coming in and we have to keep moving uh, this along. Uh, I just want to, to check with you, Bob, um, if you were, had anything to, to add here? Uh, I, I would just like, let's, we have to move on because uh, yep. of time constraints, so, uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you, uh, Chair Holden. I wanna thank uh, uh, both panelists for um, being here today and thank you again for your uh, testimony. Thank you, thank you, Chair Moya. Thank, thank you, you for Chair having Holden. us. Yeah, we will now turn to the public to, to testimony from members of the public. Members of the public will be on mute until they are recognized to testify. I will be calling groups of panelists. I will then recognize each member of the public individually. Once your name is called to testify, our staff will unmute you and the surgeon at arm will set the timer to announce that you might begin. Please confirm that your mic is unmuted before you begin speaking. Council members will have an opportunity to ask questions after each panel. I would like now to welcome Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer to testify. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You might begin now. Do we have um, the board president? I, I don't see her name. Do, is anybody else? Unfortunately, I do not see Manhattan board president. Like, okay. I guess we can I come back. Right you know? Yeah, let's go to the next. Um... Absolutely. Let's then move, move to the next. Um, panel and I just want to let the next panelists know that your testimony will be limited to uh, two minutes. I would like now to welcome our next panel, Licia Eve from Verizon, Eric Henry from Altice, Robert Hawk from Altice will also be available for questions, Robert Campbell from Charter Communications and Alex Camarda will also be available for questions as well as Najai Roach. Ms. Eve, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Time starts now. 
Hi, uh, this is Licia E. Good afternoon, Chairman Moyan, Holden, Public Advocate w Williams, and committee and subcommittee members. My name is Licia E., but I serve as a Vice President for Public Policy at Verizon, focused on driving Verizon's deployment of 5G in New York City. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today, and frankly, I'm especially proud to do so, uh, because Verizon shares with New York City a commitment towards bridging the digital divide and a common history of effective action directed toward that goal. Verizon has long-standing and deep-rooted connections with New York City and for more than 100 years has played a substantial role in the vitality of our great city. With the help of many thousands of New Yorkers who work for Verizon, we have built and maintained the best-in-class wireline and, wire and wireless uh, services and networks that are the backbone of the 21st economy. Truly a network that is built by New Yorkers and for New Yorkers. We work on an ongoing basis day after day to maintain and upgrade these networks in order to meet the ever increasing needs, the communication needs of the city and its people and businesses. Indeed, over the years, Verizon has invested billions, billions in its wireline and wireless infrastructure in New York City alone. It is also one of the city's largest taxpayers and private employers, including uh, being one of the city's largest unionized uh, employers. We recognize the obligation of businesses to support the economic, environmental, and social development of the communities in which we live and work. The testimony I submitted in advance details our extraordinary commitment uh, to New York City and to New Yorkers, especially to our children. But in the interest of time, let me share with you just some of the highlights. We are one of the group of employers that launched the New York CEO Council, which is aimed on focusing uh, on hiring 100,000 traditionally underserved New Yorkers by 2030, a goal which includes job opportunities for 25,000 CUNY students. The Verizon Innovative Learning Program uh, has a market value in terms of contribution of more than a half a billion dollars to support STEM education and under-resourced communities. In New York City, we have the most robust bills program of any city in the nation. 18 schools, uh, Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx, that have reached thousands of students and hundreds of teachers. We invest about 2 million at each of the schools, providing an iPad and a Chromebook for every student, every teacher, four years of internet access, uh, training, uh, professional development for the teachers, and even a stipend uh, for an instructional coach. We'll be bringing 5G labs to many schools across the country, including the Patrick Henry School here in New York City by 2021. We have made a $3 million commitment to providing STEM programs to elementary and middle school students in low income, specifically NYCHA, and in other affordable housing locations in the city. And we recently agreed to provide, uh, and very pleased to do so without cost, 20,000 hotspots to New York City school students as determined by the Department of Education. Last but certainly not least, Verizon through our AOL Foundation was also an initial partner of the city's Computer Science for All program and is a founding member of Breakthrough New York. Returning to broadband deployment, Verizon of course is actively engaged in establishing citywide fiber optic connectivity pursuant to our cable television franchise agreement with the city. NYCHA housing has been an important and I would say critical part of this rollout. We have to date made files available Bio service available to 91% of NYCHA households in the city. We have also launched, and I'm proud to say, a low-cost broadband program on one, under which we are offering FIOS internet service to low-income customers as pri at prices as low as $19.99 a month uh, for blazing fast speeds of 200 megabits per second. Not only can you work from home at 200 megabits per second, uh, and engage in distant learning, you can run a business with those kinds of speeds for $20 a month. This current offer uh, for new customers not only includes a year free Disney Plus and a waiver of route, router rental charges for two months, but also one year of Hulu. Bridging the digital divide and achieving the city's broadband goals requires a sound public-private partnership. I hope we all recognize that. The rich infrastructure of wireline and wireless facilities that currently exist in the city was put in place through and could not have been achieved without billions of dollars in risky private investments reflecting the forward-looking vision of companies such as Verizon and of their investors. The city of New York can and should encourage and support such private investment in a number of ways. 
We've been rolling out our fiber optic network, making files available to city residents across the city. And we're providing a competitive alternative to the geographically restricted offer offerings of the historical cable incumbents, Charter and Altice. But one of the challenges, and this is where council members in the city of New York and the administration can play a huge role. One of the challenges that we have faced in completing our endeavor and completing our build out is resistance from building owners who will not allow Verizon to extend our fiber optic network into their buildings in order to make fire service available to their tenants. Landlords should not be permitted to maintain their buildings as single provider fiefdoms, depriving their residents of the benefits of a competitive alternative. We believe that the city can uh, and should play a vital role in encouraging building owners and managers to offer access to all providers. In its capacity as the owner of property in, under, or on which providers need to build their facilities, and the CTO, uh, the general um, spoke to this, they can put in reasonable and streamlined policies to access those facilities so that we can, uh, together as a company in public and private partnership, ensure that New York City remains the leading 21st uh, technology city uh, that it deserves, that all New Yorkers do deserve. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with you information about Verizon's commitment to New York in general. And as many of my colleagues at Verizon and I have said in the past on numerous occasions, we are more than happy to meet with you to discuss our plans and potential partnerships in greater detail. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Henry, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You can begin now. Time starts now. Can't hear. Can we unmute Mr. Henry? Great, sorry about that. All right. Thank you. Uh, Eric Henry, um, Director of Government Affairs for New York City for Altice USA. Good afternoon, Chair Holden, Chair Moya, and members of the Committee on Technology and Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. It's a pleasure to testify here today. The onset of COVID-19 has forced changes in our city, such as remote learning, telecommuting, and more isolation, and have highlighted the importance of broadband connectivity for everyone in our community, especially for those with low income. The internet is a social essential tool for New York City residents now more than ever, and Altice is proud to be a partner providing robust options to meet this need. Altice is proud that it offers state-of-the-art, high-speed broadband to every household and business in our service areas of the Bronx and two-thirds of Brooklyn, which is possible because of the continued investment in a robust network. However, adoption is not ubiquitous, and we recognize the importance of understanding the challenges to adoption in order to successfully address them. So we created a combination of affordable internet plans, strategic target marketing, public-private partnerships, and other affirmative steps to improve adoption rates for those who have uh, access to in-home internet. These lessons allowed us to continue to evaluate effectiveness and evolve our approaches. In September of 2017, we launched Altice Advantage, a 30 megabytes per second broadband service for $14.99 a month for qualified low-income households defined as those with a child eligible for the free lunch program or a senior eligible for SSI. Since then, we've added lower income veterans to the qualifications. Despite being well received at the outset, we found that the initial marketing strategies used for the general population weren't resulting in the meaningful shift in broadband adoption. So we refined our approach to do more targeted marketing specifically to lower income households with children or retirees through direct mail, outbound calls, digital advertising on platforms like Facebook and Instagram and paid search optimization. To address the potential barriers for individuals uh, adopting the service, we expanded the eligibility requirements for Altice to include any household with a child attending a New York City public school. We enabled eligible households to bypass the online uh, uh, eligibility vendor and purchase Altice Advantage in real time with the sales representative. We lowered the installation costs uh, to $30 to be paid over, th over three months. And we partnered with Acer to offer uh, Altice Advantage customers uh, $150 Chromebook laptops for purchase. In New York City, we actually went a step beyond this and we offered households with, with children in public schools the opportunity to receive a free Acer laptop if they signed up for Altice Advantage at Optimum New York City stores. 
In addition, we've partnered with several New York City nonprofits to allow community residents to access the internet free of charge. And these are located uh, throughout our New York City footprint. When COVID-19 hit, we made Altice Advantage access free for 60 days to qualifying households with K through 12 and or college students and allowed for the deferment of any outstanding balance, allowing, allowing households that were previously ineligible for, for service to be connected. The company waived the verification process and allowed customers to sign up through a designated phone number, email or online. We then extended this offer to allow families to keep free service through June 30th to, to coincide with the end of the academic school year. And the company continues to defer these outstanding balances for customers that remain in good standing. We also offered schools the opportunity to utilize its, its student Wi-Fi product for free through the end of the school year, which allows Mac addresses on school issued devices to have access to the Optimum Wi-Fi network at no cost to the student's household. Altice also opened up its emergency Wi-Fi hotspots throughout the city of New York for subscribers and non-subscribers alike to access the internet free of charge. We are pleased to announce that we will be bringing back our free Altice Advantage offer through the 2020 to 21 school year, allowing for, for 60 days of free uh, Altice Advantage access for new customers with households with students, and this will be made available uh, the week of October 19th. And we'll also be adding an additional discount uh, for educators. So one thing that we've, that, that we've kind of discovered is that we, we recognize the need to develop a sustainable model that would address the digital divide in partnership with our community stakeholders, such as our school districts. Our centralized purchaser model uh, allows schools, governments, and foundations, and others to partner with Altice to provide internet to households that currently lack connectivity. We have two solutions for centralized purchase. Altice Advantage for education fixed line broadband and Wi-Fi, starting at speeds of 30 megabytes per second, and student Wi-Fi that allows for school issue devices across the optimum Wi-Fi hotspot network. Now, schools are trusted by parents, and they're in the best position to identify and vet those students that lack connectivity, either through surveys or now with the student with the student school year underway, the identification of students that have been unable to effectively participate in remote learning. Schools are also in the, in the best position to work with these households to encourage adoption. Currently, this model is in effect with the state of Connecticut and the Dalio Foundation, with partnerships and ongoing discussions with individual school districts happening as well. And we're, we're more than willing to replicate this in New York City, and we've engaged with the New York City Department of Education on the feasibility and logistics. Finally, in regards to the authorizing resolution, which is also the subject of this hearing, Altice intends to seriously study the city's proposal, its impact on our current cable and telecom services, and opportunities for innovation and future cooperation with the city. We're also mindful that any new telecommunications authorizations must be comparatively neutral with compared to the obligations imposed on Altice through its uh, franchises and must comply with federal law to avoid requirements that become regulatory barriers to the provision of our telecommunication services. And we look forward to the continuing discussion with the city on how we can build upon our success and be a continuing partner in that process today. Uh, I've, uh, this has been the, uh, the executive summary of my testimony. You have the full uh, testimony at your fingertips, council members, but thank you for the opportunity to speak before you here today. And I welcome any questions that you might have. Yeah, here. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Mr. Henry. Um, there you go, Irene. You're unmuted now. I apologize. I was on mute. I want to say thank you for your testimony again. And Mr. Capel, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You might begin. Uh, sorry about that. Good morning. Um, good afternoon, Chairperson Moy and Holden and the members of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises and the Technology Committee. My name is Rodney Capel and I'm the Vice President for Government Affairs in the New York City office here for Charter Communications, better known to you as Spectrum. I'm joined by two of my directors for Government Affairs, Alex Kamarda and Najay Roach. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the important subject of the digital divide. We have submitted lengthy testimony for the record, but in the interest of time, we're going to present a shorter version, provide information about our company and our work in bridging this digital divide issue. Uh, Spectrum is a valued employer in the New York City and state. We have about 12,000 employees in New York State, of which approximately 4,000 are in New York City. Shortly after COVID hit in March, Charter announced an increase in our minimum wage to $20, phased in by 2022 with a $1.50 immediate increase for certain frontline workers. 77% of our New York City employees are African-American, Hispanic, Asian, or Native American. 
We are also doing our part to support the communities we serve across the country during this challenging time, especially some of those economic, economically challenged communities feeling the greatest impact from this pandemic. We recently announced a $10 million investment in partnership with the National Urban League and the National Action Network to support Black and other minority-owned small businesses in underserved communities. In September, we inaugurated our first class of Spectrum Scholars, financial scholarship and mentorship initiated for eligible rising college juniors with financial need who, who identify as Asian Pacific Islander, Black, African American, Hispanic, Latino, or Native American. And in addition, excuse me, in addition to our community development initiatives, we have paid over, or close to $200 million in franchise fee payments to the city since 2016, provided free channels for public education and government use, and spent tens of millions in capital investment for nearly all of the city's not-for-profit public assets. Yes. Did someone call me? In recent months and years, Spectrum has attempted to address the digital, digital divide with the city. We have formally and informally through discussions and written submissions sought to work with the city to provide discounted internet services to residents in public housing and homeless shelters, to educators and school students in schools, to low income seniors and to other communities in need. We stand ready to partner with the city and immediately deliver discounted services to tens of thousands of disadvantaged New Yorkers. We have five ways the Spectrum is currently bridging into digital divide. Number one, Spectrum provided four months that's two 60 day free offer periods of free broadband internet service in 2020 to educator or student households without services. In response to the pandemic, Charter announced a remote education offer which provided 60 days of free high speed broadband service to K through 12 and college students or educators without existing internet service from Spectrum. The first enrollment period ran from March 16th through June 30th enrolled roughly 450,000 households nationwide, including tens of thousands in New York State and New York City with free 200 millibits per second service in house in-home Wi-Fi and a free self-installation. And recently on September 21st, the offer was relaunched to provide additional connectivity relief for new subscribers without internet from Spectrum. Number two, Spectrum maintained service for customers experiencing economic hardship because of COVID when they did not pay their bills. We did not charge late fees and forgave $85 million in customer debt. Spectrum signed the Keep America Connected Pledge with the FCC, which ensured customers connected with us because of hardships due to COVID-19 would not be disconnected or charge late fees through June 30th. As the benefit of the Keep America Connected Pledge ended, we forgave a portion of customers' delinquent balances, made their accounts current, and put them in 12-month payment plans to pay the outstanding balances over time. Number three, Spectrum offered Spectrum Internet Assist high-speed discounted internet service for low-income students and seniors, which we launched with then public advocate Trish, Trish James and council member Ben Kalis in 2017 in New York City. This discounted service just $14.99 per month in New York City, $19.99 per month with Wi-Fi wi with Wi-Fi service, while providing speeds of up to 30 millibits per second for downloading data and four millibits for upload. Student households receive lunch at school through their national school lunch program uh, are eligible to receive the Spectrum Internet Assist, which includes all students in New York City public schools through the community eligibility provision of the NSLP. Spectrum Internet Assist is also avail available for all seniors 65 or older receiving supplemental social security income. Number four, Spectrum launched State Connected K-12, a product for facilitating the remote learning during the COVID pandemic and beyond. Charter recently launched a new product specifically for schools and school districts. It enables any school or district to purchase broadband internet delivered to students and educated, uh, educator households at a cost of $29.99 per user. This enables schools or a school district to purchase service for student in need and do so for a flexible time at low price point. The school or district maintains a business relationship with Spectrum. It handles billing and account management in conjunction with Spectrum while Spectrum provides installation, technical, and customer service directly to the student or educator household. We believe low cost price offerings, price offerings like these can make virtual education easier to implement. We spoke twice during the summer to senior executives at the New York City Department of Ed regarding our state connected offer, which could serve all New York City schools in our footprint, since every student in New York City school system is eligible for NSLP. Lastly, we built 40 learning labs in New York City 
We partner with nonprofits like the Police Athletic League, Chinese American Planning Council, YWCA, Easter Seals, LGBT Center, Hispanic Federation, National Action Network, Catholic Charities, Hudson Guild, and, and recently the Lower East Side Girls Club, <clears throat> excuse me, to build technology labs to reach economically challenged neighborhoods where not all families have in-home access to internet. Each one of these learning labs costs roughly 100,000 to equip and maintain with free broadband service for a total commitment for approximately $4 million of the cost of, 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 of the labs that we built. These are just a few of the things that we are doing to help students and families in need. I hope these many initiatives demonstrate the spectrum cares deeply about closing the digital divide we are working diligently to do our part. In closing, the city faces its greatest challenge in the months and years ahead to overcome the COVID pandemic and its effects. History has shown that the city can overcome this challenge, but its success requires that all stakeholders in the city come together to forge solutions. Spectrum wants to partner with the city to address these challenges and be a part of the city's comeback. If the city will extend its hand, we will embrace in a collaboration to face the formidable issues we collectively face. We welcome any questions now you may have. Thank you, thank you uh, Rodney, for uh, your testimony. Uh, that light behind you, is it doing you any favors? Um, but uh, I'm gonna turn it over to our council now. Uh, do we have any more panelists that are? I, I believe uh, that all three panelists that we had uh, for this panel, and now I wanna turn to our chairs for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Uh, good to see everybody. Thank you again for your testimony today. Uh, just a couple of questions. One, let me just say, good to finally have uh, all of you here at uh, my hearing. Uh, I know we missed a couple of you the last time, so it's good that there's been an improvement now in attendance, so that's always good. Um, I love that everyone's touting all these great programs, but I kind of want to just jump right into this. Uh, a little bit because uh, we talked about sort of the, the, the discounted programs and um, you know what we've been doing for seniors here. Uh, but let me ask you this. So do the people uh, on the low income plan, and I believe Rodney, you were just talking about this, have the same download uh, and upload speeds as those, uh, the, as those you provide to customers who pay full monthly price? If, if we can unmute uh, Mr. Capel. He's no Hi, Mr. 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 Chair, for Altice, the uh, speech for the Altice Advantage for the $14.99 per month uh, discounted rates are 30 megabytes per second. And is that the same though as your full paying customers? So the, the tiers uh, vary depending on the, uh, the price -age plan that individuals uh, sign up for. Uh, so it just varies uh, based upon kind of the, the customer choice. For your discounted senior program and those that you're providing in low income communities. So you're saying, if I get this right, Mr. Henry, you're telling me that they're given a choice within that uh, $14 a month uh, package that they're being offered or is it one specific package that they get for their internet service? Just no, the, the, the package uh, is the $14.99 per month at 30 megabytes. 30 megabytes. And what is the package that a full paying customer that goes to Altice uh, gets? So the, I have to check to see what exactly the, the pricing levels are for some of our other plans. I do know that uh, from our experiences and those that have, those customers that have taken advantage of the plan, they proved sufficient for the, for the purposes uh, that, that, that the, uh, that the uh, discounted rate ostensibly would go to solve for. Right, right, but the speed, the speed. So let's take your basic package, okay? Your basic 
entry entry level package. Where do, where do you start there? So I could circle back with my uh, team council member in terms of the, the the tiers that exist. I don't have that information directly offhand. Okay. So so let me go to to to, to you, Rodney. Same question and and uh, first, Lisha. I apologize. Yeah, I had some difficulties. Um, there's different speeds for our uh, full price service as opposed to the SIA price. Right. So, but the senior, again, I'm going to ask the question again, right? Yeah. I'm so, sorry. so the low income plan, right? Yes. Same download speed uh, as those that you're providing to your customers who pay full monthly uh, uh, price. It is a, it is a different speed. Um, the majority of our um, full price, if you will, as you mentioned, uh, is about 200 uh, MB, MBP uh, at, uh, per second. Um, our sp spectrum internet assist is roughly about 30 to four. So it's a, it's a, it's a slower speed in that way that you're describing, uh, but we think it's sufficient for the need uh, for many families who are educating at home uh, and who are using Zoom uh, and it meets the FCC standards uh, of which Right, you're, you're, meeting, you're basically meeting the basic, uh, you know, uh, 30 MBs uh, that the FCC requires you to do uh, for uh, your low income package. Correct. Correct. So you're doing the bare minimum here. We're doing we're doing the standard that has been given by the FCC. Right. The bare minimum, right? You're 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 offering them the bare minimum, right? That, that's that's what we're saying. We're starting off at the very bottom, right? The, the least required number that you have to offer, that's where you're starting it off, right? There, there are slower speeds. So there, there's not the bare minimum of speeds. There can be it's a slower, slower speed. But you're required by the FCC to do it at 30, right? Correct, correct. And so my, the reason why I'm getting at this is that you know, while we're touting all of the things that we're trying to do within the low-income communities and for seniors, we're not getting the same quality uh, services there. It's it it's less, especially now that we're living in this uh, 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 sort of uh, COVID world uh, that we have to, you know, uh, telecommute uh, uh, from home. Uh, we have kids uh, uh, learning remotely. When we know that, you know, 18% of the uh, city's population in low income communities have absolutely zero access to the internet. Uh, you know, this isn't something that is, we should be telling that we're doing such a great job here. I mean, you have the ability to change that. Uh, and so I just want to put it into perspective of when you say these things, you, you know, you're, you're almost coming in here saying like, we're doing this great service here uh, to these communities that uh, have a lack of access. Communities that are black and brown communities that have consistently been left at the wayside when it comes to the, uh, the advancements of the internet. So I, I just wanna make sure that I'm hearing this correctly. And when you guys say that we're offering these great programs and these great discounts, that we know exactly what we're getting. Well, Mr. Chairman, if I can answer that question on behalf of Verizon and very much appreciate the sentiment behind your question, let me be clear. Our low cost broadband offer does not offer a less than or inferior service to our full paying customers, full stop. For $19.99 a month, a person can get, a, a low income individual, lifeline qualified can receive 200 megabits per service. My guess is there are probably many members of the city council who do not have 200 megabit service at home or at work. Low income New Yorkers for 1999 can get 200 megabit service uh, plus a, a, a number of other benefits uh, added on there. I mentioned Disney Plus, Hulu, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, I'm very proud uh, to, to communicate that on behalf of Verizon. 
uh, and to be clear and unequivocal in answering your question, it is not less than for the poorest of New Yorkers. It is a top quality, best in class, world class service for twenty dollars a month. And I want I also want to follow up and make sure, and if we can open up the line for Alex and my team as well, who can help with this. We are also very proud of this offer as well. We do not give the minimum requirement. We give the the, the requirement that we have been given yes, um, that right, works with families. Right. The one that the SPC requires you to get. We, we and, and at a cheaper price too, right? And so it's at a cost as effective for, for folks to be able to afford. Uh, and we believe that it is a, a, a great support network uh, for folks who are looking for a low cost in their uh, right. offer. Let, Alex, let, Alex, can you provide some additional? Yeah, I mean, council member, just to clarify, the FCC standard is 25.3. So we exceed that standard at 34, 30 megabytes per second for the, uh, and four for upload. So, but I think what the more important point is this, what's the point of the service? What our service allows for is two users simultaneously to do a multi-person call like this in a household. It allows for watching a movie, surfing the internet. So it meets all the basic needs and more for students uh, who are currently learning through virtual learning. That's the most important aspect of the, of the program, not how great the speed is, but what you can do well, with it. You guys are touting how great the, the speed is and how you've gone into you know, communities of color, into NYCHA buildings. So I'm just trying to get some clarity here on like where we actually are in, in, in those communities. What levels of services are being provided to the poor uh, in New York City? We know that there is a huge digital divide. And when we see that this is happening in our communities, I wanna just be clear about it. You know, you, you have the opportunity to change these things. I'm just getting clarity as we go through your testimony. So thank you for that, but I'm gonna to stick to this for a second because uh, uh, this, is, this is important. Um, so how do, you, uh, how do you plan to provide affordable uh, high-speed internet to low-income customers outside of that 60-day uh, uh, free internet deal that you're, you're offering uh, for first-time customers uh, this fall? Um, and, and also, is that including the, your existing customers? Go ahead, Alex. We have, council member, there are a few offers that we have uh, worked on and that we have shared with, with some of your colleagues and, and with your office over the summer that aside from, uh, in addition to, I should say- the Nigel, I'm sorry, can you speak a little, little louder? Because Are you having trouble hearing me? I apologize. You're just a little low. Right. Okay, sorry about that. Is that better? A little bit. Okay, so we have made a number of, of uh, uh, sort of offers that would, as we believe, provide a more- Hey, Nigel, you're gonna, you're gonna have to speak up a little bit more. Sorry. Volume here. All right. Maybe it's that 30 megabyte. Repeat the question one more time, Chairman, just so we have sure. on the question. So how do we plan to provide the uh, affordable high-speed internet to low-income customers outside of the 60-day uh, free internet deal that you're offering uh, to first-time customers this autumn? And does that also uh, include to existing customers? So as I mentioned in our remarks earlier on, you know, we have some some offers that we think would be helpful to, in particular, the student population uh, that is most affected by uh, the pandemic. Uh, we have offered our state connected plan uh, that can be um, you know, worked through with a relationship with the city, uh, which takes the price point away from the actual consumer uh, and works uh, directly with Spectrum uh, and the Department of Ed. We've reached out to the Department of Ed to work uh, in conjunction with them on this bulk arrangement uh, and then in addition to that, we've also tried to uh, work uh, uh, in relation with bulk arrangements across the city uh, with residential, uh, as the RFI mentioned in the um, original uh, panel discussed, um, you know, having an opportunity to provide, uh, again, that low cost offer uh, for residentials at a bulk rate uh, 
uh, allows for us to be able to have a long-term solution uh, beyond that 60-day offer. And, and that includes existing customers or no? That can, that can include existing, correct. That can include existing customers as well. So uh, this is, when you guys say that, you know, you, you're, you're providing this service, uh, I believe Alex, you were saying that, um, you know, it was, it was 25 by the FCC's definition for broadband, right? But right. it was 30 that the FCC required as part of the merger uh, with you and Time Warner, right? Correct? No, I'm saying the standard for high-speed broadband that's stated by the FCC is 25.3. For Spectrum Internet Assist, we offer 34. So we exceed the standard is the point I was trying to make. Got it, but you had to be at 30 because of the merger. Is that correct? I, I believe that we set that that level above the FCC definition for high-speed broadband. That was something that we did. Okay, but that was part of the deal was that it had to be 30, right? That was it, correct? 30 and up. I, I don't know that that was specified as part of the merger, that speed level. Okay, so that speed says, you say that um, that will get you about uh, two people to be able to operate on uh, their, you know, uh, computer. Uh, they can be working on Zoom, and their kid could be uh, remote learning, right? So th this is this is the question that goes to, to to everyone here because you know I've been talking to a lot of uh, uh, parents, uh, the PTA parents from my district uh, that really have talked about the fact that while all of this is being offered for free, if uh, you had a um, outstanding cable bill uh, with their provider, uh, they uh, would somehow not be able to access uh, the high-speed internet until uh, they actually uh, paid uh, their bill. Uh, is that the practice that you guys are doing here? So if folks were coming in here, they had a uh, they had a delinquent bill, uh, they were behind on their payments. This this free access to the internet, high speed internet, they were not able to access because they didn't pay the bill. Is that so, practice that is happening here? So, council member for Altis, uh, when uh, eligible households stated that they wanted, uh, regardless of whether they had a past due balance or not, wanted to sign up for the um, the free internet service if you had a, a, a child attending a New York City public school. We deferred their outstanding balances. Uh, and we, and uh, that was done up until uh, September 30th of this year. And I think that, you know, going back to your previous uh, uh, question about, you know, what options are available, I think this really presents an opportune time to really engage, re-engage with the city. We, we engaged with the city a few months back but with the New York City Department of Education around you know, that centralized purchaser model, um, which, which allows for these high speeds for centralized purchase through the city of New York, through the New York City Department of Education. And you know, this solves for a lot of the, the, the issues that you've been talking about. You know, eligible, uh, help households are eligible to receive internet connectivity regardless of any past due balances. Um, school districts uh, like, like the DOE, identify the households that lack this connectivity uh, and assured that any funds used to subsidize service are solely used for internet connectivity. Uh, schools don't have to handle service support calls from households. Households are given uh, dedicated customer service lines through optimum uh, customer service to address any issues. And we think that that's one of the uh, uh, kind of last remaining barriers that we see towards uh, you know, solving for the problem that, 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 that you mentioned. So we look forward, to, again, we, we always, uh, we stand at the ready to re-engage with the DOE to, to talk about how we can make that into reality. Is it possible we can unmute Nijay for us again? Just... Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Hey, Nijay. Oh, wait, hold on. Hold on, Nijay. I think we had you for a second. There we go. Yes, I did want to clarify, Council Member, that that is not the policy. Uh, that customers who did have a past. In the day. Yes, sir. 
you're still really low for me. I'm sorry. I don't know if it's me or or what. It's possible it's not you. I apologize. Okay. Having no. some te some technical Perfect. difficulties here. Perfect. There you go. Okay. I was trying to clarify that uh, that is not the policy. Customers that have a past due balance at one point, uh, very early on, I want to say within the first week, we did get word that there were some issues, and we very quickly reached out to those customers and connected them so they were brought into the offer. And that has not been the policy, no. So I lost some of that. What are you saying? That uh, the people that were not included in that in the beginning were later brought on? Very quickly, within like a day or so of us being notified that they were not included, that we reached out to them and, and made sure that they, they and their households were brought into the free service. So everyone that was that, that was late or delinquent uh, was brought into that? That's correct. This was back in maybe the second week of March when we first announced the offer. There were, I would say, uh, some households that we were notified that had trouble signing up and we, our team personally reached out to them and, and worked with them to get them connected. Okay. So I'm just getting clarity. No one was left out. Everyone got in. To our knowledge, everyone that wanted free service and, and called, that called in was able to get connected. We, we have had this, this is now our second round and we haven't been made aware from, from our customers or, 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 uh, or any of our, our partners that there have been issues with, with getting these folks in our service area connected. Got it. So, I, so I'm gonna stick with that uh, because Mr. Henry had talked a little bit about what uh, they want to do in terms of coming back into the city and talking. So what have all uh, of the uh, providers that are here today, what kind of outreach uh, did you do uh, this spring to ensure that uh, people were eligible for this no cost 60 days of internet? Um, you know, how do they know about the offers uh, and how were they able to take advantage of this? What was that kind of outreach that was done uh, in these communities uh, to uh, let them know that this is that this is there. We use direct mail as we use for our, our current um, CEO portfolio. It's a direct um, agenda. We work with com community partners. We have put um, a link on the offer directly in the hands of our partners at senior centers, uh, community service locations that have a footprint in the district. Um, and we've also worked with our, our partners in government and, and made sure that they were aware if they had any constituent outreach. Um, we spoke with a number of your colleagues about that as well to make sure that the word was getting out and that these households were aware. Um, and it wasn't Rodney just- never called me. I'm sorry? Rodney never called me. You have the high speed, uh, <laughs> high cost. So, so we also, uh, like I said, we also, in, in addition to the, the direct outreach that we do, as per usual with SIA, this, this offer wasn't just limited to, SIA, limited to SIA eligible households. So we sent out, you know, our marketing team used their direct, their direct mail efforts, like I said, and we also worked with our partners, but heavily relied on our partnerships in the community engagement space, because obviously, as things were closing during the pandemic, our usual um, direct in hand uh, efforts were not were not as viable in, in that setting. So we did work with those organizations, whether they had mailing lists, listserv, whether they were churches, whether they were libraries, to make sure that we maximized every point of contact that they had with our with our uh, within our service area. In multiple languages. That's correct. We have lang We also have language line, uh, which is a uh, feature that we offer with our SIA enrollment. We're over two hundred languages and dialects are available. If a customer calls in and needs language assistance, that language line service is there um, at the, their election to help them uh, get through the enrollment process. This is an important point, council member, because for the Spectrum Internet Assist Program, this is something that, as you know, and as council member Kalos alluded to, we actually began several years ago. And for the marketing of that, we've done at least one mailing to the targeted audience per month, dating back years. So that's uh, extensive outreach coupled with the direct marketing that Najee spoke of, where we're going into neighborhoods, um, partnering with nonprofits. We've done backpack giveaways where we've given away just in the last month, uh, over 2000 backpacks. And inside those backpacks for students was an insert about the Spectrum Internet Assist program that they could enroll in and benefit from. Mr. Chairman, on behalf of Verizon, uh, you know, we say our policy has changed over time and in a way that's, that's good. Um, uh, 
let me answer, uh, I guess you had two or three questions um, in what you posed to uh, my colleagues at Altice and Charter. Uh, Verizon instituted something called a Keep Americans Connected program. Because historically, if you did have a past due balance, you weren't able to, to get a new service, whether you were a low income customer or a high income customer uh, that uh, may have had the means but just chose not to pay a bill. And so we instituted this Keep Americans Connected program. As of just last week, more than 1.2 million of our customers signed up for that program, including many New Yorkers. And basically what that program does is it lets it, it ensures that they stay connected to our service, uh, that they are eligible for uh, offerings uh, that they may be eligible for, but it basically allows them to have a payment plan over a period um, of many months. And we even have made provisions, again, this is a policy in flux, but it's in flux in a good way, in a progressive way. Uh, we've even modified the plan over the recent weeks and months so that even if someone didn't adhere to the payment plan but is reaching out to us and making efforts to do so, uh, you know, we're, we're accommodating them. So that is a, a very significant change from how Verizon has historically um, operated. Um, I mean, if you don't pay your water bill, you know, some municipalities can, you know, uh, can foreclose on your home. So um, we are a business, but our customers are our priority. Um, we don't exist without them. And uh, so we're very pleased with this program. Now we have a, a small number of customers who may have signed up for the program, aren't making any um, payments in pursuant to what they agreed they said they would do. Um, and in those instances, we're saying, no, you're not eligible for a new service. But even recently, we further modified that proposal and said, basically, if the balance is uh, not substantial, uh, that you too can be eligible um, to take advantage of offers, uh, uh, um, uh, take advantage of new offers. So it's been a policy that has changed over time, frankly, but it has changed uh, in a good way. Um, I can't speak with great specificity with respect to the marketing, but by definition, 1.2 million of our customers signing up for that program, by definition, uh, says to me that uh, the program was marketed pretty successfully. In, Where, the, in, the, in the city? No, that's 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 nationwide, but and I can get you the, the New can York you get city, me the city numbers. I yeah. can get you the New York City specific numbers, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. One of the areas, frankly, though, um, where, um, and, and I've discussed this with the CTO directly, uh, as have some of my colleagues at Altice and Charter, um, you know, speaking for Verizon, but I think the industry and working with the city of New York, we can be doing collectively more outreach uh, to communities, letting them know about the various offers that, that, um, that we provide. We don't provide free internet service, but we provide world-class, uh, 200 megabit service for $20 a month. And so we are doing more to advertise uh, um, those offers. And, and I have invited um, the city of New York, specifically the CTO's office to work in partnership with his office uh, to get the word out to as many New Yorkers as possible. Great, thank you. Uh, I have uh, one more question. I'm gonna turn it over then to um, um, Council Member Holden as well. Uh, and this is to, to you, Lisha. You had mentioned in your testimony about not gaining access to buildings. Uh, any data that uh, shows the number of property owners uh, who don't allow you to get access? Oh, ab oh, absolutely. Um, some of that information is proprietary, Mr. Chairman, but uh, I can get you that information in very short order uh, because, you know, listen, We've made this investment. We want to get to as many customers as possible. In that respect, the city of New York, uh, the members of the city council, the administration and Verizon, we are 100% aligned in that goal. I mean, to be blunt, my building and the, the entity that owns my collection of buildings will not let my company in. I'm a vice president of Verizon and I am a customer of one of our fierce competitors because we have been fighting to get, you know, what I think is the best service uh, into my building so that I, even as a Verizon employee in the city of New York could have it. A little bit embarrassing, but that really is a testament to how fiercely some of the building owners and managers 
have locked out Verizon and reduce uh, the uh, availability for competition for best in class services to many New Yorkers, uh, including unfortunately myself. And so we can get you that list um, and um, would be happy to meet with you at your convenience to bring in members of our operations team uh, to, to talk about how we can, we can tackle this problem because um, it's, it's not in the best interest of New York City residents that this problem uh, continues to exist we are ready to spend significant capital resources. One of the things that you know that I didn't mention in our testimony is, um, you know, we spend 17 to 18 billion dollars in capex every year deploying our networks, including billions that we've invested here, and we do that without one penny in taxpayer dollars. We don't need President Trump. We don't need Congress. We don't need resources from the city of New York. We just need a partnership. And then we are ready to roll and do what needs to be done for New Yorkers. And so we will get you that information and would welcome any help that you could provide in helping us address this issue uh, for the interests of, of all New Yorkers. Great. Uh, you know, I'm just gonna end it with this because uh, you know everyone came in here with these, these great numbers and, and wonderful presentations of like all the great services and the fast speed internet that everyone is doing, you know, for, uh, New Yorkers at this moment, but but out of this has come out that there needs to be a, a, a lot more to close that digital divide in communities of color, in places that look like you and me that don't have the access uh, to high speed internet, that don't have the ability to do it. When people, uh, in, you know, in in communities like mine where the uh, are mostly immigrant families, the the, the only way that they can get to the internet is through their mobile phone. Uh, we need to do a lot more here. And, and one of the things that I see is that, you know, the studies that have been uh, shown uh, say that uh, the U.S. broadband customers are paying uh, more money for, for low speed uh, broadband uh, than customers abroad. And so I, I'm leaving it with this. How do we explain that? How do we explain that we come in here and we talk about the, 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 the wonderful uh, uh, new initiatives that we have going on here and access to, to high-speed internet, uh, but yet we are seeing st statistical studies that show that we are paying more money for a low broadband than people abroad. How, how, do, you, how do you respond to that? Well, I would say in the case of Verizon that that's just simply just not true. 200 megabit service is truly world-class service, truly world-class service for $20 a month. And the faster that we can get into more buildings, I mean, we've covered most of the city, but there are pockets uh, where in buildings where we still have challenges, the faster that we can get into those buildings, the Competition is good for everybody, right? It's it's it most significantly the city of New York. So, um, again, I just you know welcome the partnership and I appreciate your leadership in in uh, co-hosting this hearing. And uh, we stand ready to work with you to to move forward on the deployment issue um, uh, as effectively and as quickly as possible. Thank you. Let me just add, I, you know, I think some historical perspective is also instructive. I mean, a, a decade ago. Typical internet service was eight megabits, and and now um, we're talking about affordable programs that are 30 and above that. And for Spectrum, our flagship offering is 200 megabits. So that's all because of the investment that uh, Alicia Eve spoke of. Uh, combined, the internet service providers have actually spent 1.5 trillion dollars since the mid 90s on their networks. That's an enormous amount of money. We've spent 40 billion just in the last five years at Spectrum. And that, those kind of capital expenditures are what has made uh, the internet as fast as it is today. And for Altis, you know, we've known that the, the digital divide is something that has kind of affected New Yorkers for a few years, which is why we, we, we launched Altis Advantage. And we wanted to make sure that at this, at this very low discounted rate, as many New Yorkers were, uh, were apprised of the offering as possible. So we, uh, we engaged in a, in a heavy, a research and marketing campaign to make sure that you know the communities that would benefit most from this offer, which would be those with low income, veterans, um, the elderly, you know, actually knew that this existed. We we, we partnered with with community organizations. We 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 placed we placed ads on consumer websites and uh, and, and through our school districts and our, our contacts uh, and our business account reps. 
um, we waived a lot of the uh, red tape that would uh, might deter individuals uh, from wanting to sign up. We made we really promoted ease of access for, for our low cost offerings. In addition to when uh, COVID hit, really opening it up uh, and making it free for you know a, a, port, a population of our of our city that really needed the most, which is you know our students, uh, whether they be K through 12 or college students. Uh, this was available to them, and and we continued that line of, of aggressive advertising to make sure that they knew this was there. I think that, you know, as we get ready to, to relaunch the program this month, this free program, I think that, you know, this is a great opportunity, again, uh, for the city to, 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 to re-engage uh, around you know, centralized purchasing and really promoting, you know, ease of access, particularly for our students, that comes at absolutely no cost to households that need it the most. And, and I, I think that, we, that it's, it's sustainable. I think that it's workable. I think it's feasible. It's worked in Connecticut. It's worked for you know several foundations, uh, uh, you know within our footprint. So I, I think that there's definitely room to collaborate here, and we look forward to continuing that that strong partnership that we've enjoyed with the City of New York over the past well, know, years I, of our partnership. I, I could go on all day long with with you guys uh, because I have a ton of questions here, but I think that there needs to be uh, a lot more uh, improvements that we see here not just coming in to tout uh, all this uh, fast internet service. We got to work together here and we got to close the digital divide. There is no doubt in my mind that we have an obligation to this city, to the people who are suffering the most throughout this pandemic, the poor, the, the, the people in communities of color that have been suffering throughout this, this entire pandemic still don't have the necessary basic needs to get through this. And you as the providers, that are the, 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 the main providers here in the city of New York have to take on a real responsibility here. And I'm glad to hear that you wanna work with the city, but there's a lot of things that we need to do uh, to get this uh, really moving in the right direction, especially in our communities. So uh, that's it for me. Uh, I wanna uh, take this opportunity not to thank you all for your testimony today. Um, and I just wanna turn it over now to uh, Chair uh, Holden for some questions. Thank you, Chair Moy, uh, and I'll be try to be brief. Um, and by the way, very good questions. Um, I, I've had I've been um, very skeptical of most uh, internet providers and cable companies, having dealt with several of them and for the past uh, several years. And reading the five fine print is very very important. And usually these <laughs> offers are fleeting and they only last for a short period of time and then skyrockets. Um, I just wanna ask Spectrum, the Spectrum reps, uh, we've seen several articles from across New York State uh, reporting that Spectrum plans to raise prices for service uh, in Rochester, for instance, Buffalo and Albany. Is that going to happen in New York City? Are you gonna raise prices soon? In terms of our low in internet offer? No, yeah. we've not raised it. But you, you are raising it in the other cities in New York State. And we have not raised it in New York City. But you are planning to do it in other cities. I, I believe that there's a different price point for it in other cities. We've right. made a, a decision to not do that here in New York City. Okay, because um, we've seen uh, companies raise their prices over a period of time. We understand that you have to make a profit. But tell me what, what's the cost of the company? And this goes for everybody. What's the cost of the company to provide faster internet service for, for students, right? Because I don't think 30 uh, megabytes per second is essentially adequate. I know it's the minimum or near the minimum, but I don't think if you have a bunch of kids on the, in the same household, we've seen it in, in my office that we will freeze at times, even though we have faster internet service. So. Um, I'm not, um, I don't know what it costs the company to provide 200 versus 30. Uh, can, you t can somebody elaborate on that? Like why can Verizon offer 200 for $20 and Spectrum can't? And Jay, do you wanna? I was going to just chime in, council member, to say that the the infrastructure that that has been fully provided in New York City 
We are fully built out as was required by our franchise. And so if a household has a higher need and has a higher demand uh, for speed and service, that there are options available. The, the, I want to come back to the point about okay, the- Can you, you those options? A household, for example, you know, if a household has, you know, three, you know, heavy activity gamers and maybe, you know, students who are using Zoom or WebEx or similar platforms to do their e-learning, you know, every household's needs are different. And so while I, I know there's been a, a reference to the 30 megabits um, as a sort of a bare minimum, I do want to state that that is, it's not a bare minimum. While it is a, it is a, a, a floor, that floor contemplates the essential needs that an average household has in the 21st century. Now, that's not to say that there aren't households that exceed that demand. Um, I'm sure among us gathered here, there are some of us that use more data on our various platforms and others. But I do want to say that the infrastructure that has been invested, that Charter has invested in in New York City, that infrastructure is available throughout our residential service area. So if a household has higher needs and the level of activity that they conduct is, it re requires a higher speed of service, there are multiple plans available, but the Spectrum Internet Assist plan is not intended to be a, you know, a, a service point for, you know, heavy gaming or high demand usage. And I think that that's consistent with, with what some of our colleagues here have said, but it is, it is, and it's critical at this point, it is sufficient to allow the average use, that, that benchmark, that, that Obama FCC benchmark was set based on what usage trends were and it is then still the case our customers that are that are enrolled in spectrum internet assist you know have not complained to us that the speeds that they receive are inadequate to allow for regular household usage um so i would just say that i think that that's an important point to note in this conversation that this the, the, the number of the speed itself while it does correlate to a type of user and a type of internet usage, it is by no means an inadequate standard um, as was determined by the, the federal, state and, and local governments at the time that it was established. And we have consistently um, been found to meet and exceed the speeds that, that, are, that are promoted. So while all of us here can maybe speak to uh, anecdotal bits where there are uh, interferences or things of that nature that are sort of the course of business in this space, I do want to just make sure that we underscore that point, that that service that we are offering, it is it is reliable and it, and it is consistently available in all of the communities that we serve. Well, we've seen, we've seen, and I've seen it in my house and I've seen it in my, in my, in my office, which I, you know, we have Charter, we have Spectrum, that the speeds don't always, you don't always get what's advertised. It'll drop below, depending on the neighborhood and, and issues in the neighborhood. And also, which is never told, very seldom is this told to a, a customer, that it's also depending on the wiring in your house, the cables and so forth, how old it is and, and the quality. Um, so I'm not buying any of this, really. I'm, I also know that um, in, in, I guess, 20, June, 20, uh, June 17, 2020, um, Charter, filed a petition with FCC to terminate the data caps uh, to let the company out of the commitments it made in 2016 as part of the merger, which was mentioned before with Time Warner. So, you know, th th it's a little disingenuous um, because we've seen Spectrum, we've seen, we've seen Charter in action, um, and I'm not totally satisfied with the answers today, but let me just move on to Verizon for a second. Um, you said there were 20,000 hotspots you're offering um, to DOE to, to around schools, you said? Uh, the, the Department of Education will ultimately determine uh, what children and families will receive those hotspots. Um, but we understand um, a, a very significant uh, number of the 20,000 will be going to uh, students in NYCHA facilities. Uh, potentially some students in shelters. Uh, and so, but, but, you know, we wanted to provide this critical assistance. Uh, we didn't want to be in the decision of deciding who we thought uh, DOE was best positioned. And so the Department of Education will be making those specific decisions. Uh, but a large, the, the focus obviously by definition is with respect to children uh, in need who do not have um, robust so, so connectivity. Just to interrupt, so the 20,000, 
priority will be placed in NYCHA or DOE or schools? D DOE will be making the determination as to what 20,000 students receive those uh, hotspots, but we understand a significant portion, potentially as many as 40% of the students who will receive them are in NYCHA facilities, but it's going to be for DOE to make the determination as to right, where- why, leaving it up to DOE, why, why not you, why don't you decide? Why doesn't Verizon decide? Well, listen, I mean, I, we are great at what we do. We believe, however, that DOE is, is best, better positioned than we are um, because it has a better understanding than an individual company as to where specifically uh, the needs are. And so we defer to DOE, but we were pleased and proud uh, to provide to provide these 20,000 hotspots. Uh, may I ask when you made that offer to DOE? Because I know they're notoriously... They move at a snail um, it was relative it was relatively recent mr chairman um and, and i don't want to get ahead of uh, doe but happy to to reach out to you as early as tomorrow with 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 greater specificity but i didn't want to get ahead of uh whatever doe may be announcing uh publicly but i wish that the verizon would would actually uh, offer it to or near the hotspots near nycha buildings and make that decision rather than leave it up to to uh the DOE to decide where they're putting you you're putting it because I think you can you can kind of like we know where NYCHA is we know that they're underserved so we we should be able to solve that without DOE getting involved and adding another layer but that's that's up to your company but I would mm -hmm. just recommend that but let me let me get into the business because uh, I know you're talking about the business the um, resistance from building owners um, what incentive do you offer the business the I'm sorry the building um, uh, superintendents or the owners to get into a building? Is there any incentive, like a discounted rate for a year or so? Well, I appreciate the question, Mr. Chairman. Um, we actually do offer, um, uh, my, uh, my colleagues at uh, Chartered Altis uh, references as well, Mr. Capel did about bulk offers. So uh, we have a number of buildings in neighborhoods all across the city of New York, as our competitors do, where we offer bulk offers. So so we can come into the building and offer um, a great rate for the building writ large, and then it can decide how it wants to make those services available to individual residents by baking in an extra certain amount uh, of money each month into the rent, and everybody has the service, or individual um, uh, residents in a particular building uh, can avail themselves. So the bulk offer process is one that by definition is a great deal. If a building enters into a bulk uh, arrangement, um, that is going to newer to the benefit of the building as well as the individual residents. And frankly, um, because I believe that Verizon does provide a best in class service because it is all fiber. All fiber does mean that you have a more robust connect. That's why we can offer 200 megabit service uh, for uh, $20 a month for low income customers. So benefit number one, uh, uh, it can be a lower cost for the building and individual residents uh, via the bulk offer. And, you know, sometimes uh, we'll, there'll be older buildings where we'll have to do some mold because, you know, they want us to uh, make sure that we protect certain types of molding and not to get into the minutia but that can be incredibly expensive uh, using NYCHA as an example. We have spent millions of dollars, millions of dollars beyond the basics of our deployment and NYCHA buildings alone because NYCHA had very specific requirements about what specific type of molding we should be placing over the fiber optic cable in those buildings. So um, there are certain accommodations that, that we make that are additional cost to us that we do not pass on. Uh, uh, to the building owners. So those are a couple of examples of the incentives and the willingness to, to, to work in partnership. Well, I, again, I think, I, I think the city should see that we have competition within buildings. So I'd like to talk to you more about that. Um, I know we have a busy agenda today, so I'll, I'll cut it short, uh, Chair Moya. Um, and I know, I think there's a, count, a council member with questions. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Chair uh, Holden. Uh, for your uh, questions. Uh, I now want to uh, turn it over uh, to uh, Councilmember Kalos for some questions. Your time starts now. 
Thank you. I know that DOIT is still watching the hearing and I'm requesting that they submit an answer in writing whether the city can require franchisees to lay strands of fiber for the city's use, such as for municipal broadband. I want to thank Charter for their partnership in providing high speed 30 megabit internet to low income families for $14.99 a month. So I want to thank Altis for following this model. And I also want to thank Charter for direct mailings that I've also requested. And I appreciate this public private partnership. For context, what I want to share is that before Tish James and I weighed in on the Charter Time Warner merger, the low cost option option of everyday low price was $14.99 a month for three, three megabits. Uh, that wasn't before 2010. That was like back in 2015, 16, 17. And uh, now, and that's 10 times slower. So right now I'm actually fighting the mayor who's giving kids LT devices and saying that's broadband when it's not. And that being said, with all the franchisers expired, I hope I'll have the chair support demanding a minimum of 100 megabits or faster speeds as we do these renewals. Now, when the pandemic began at the urging of Clayton Banks of Silicon Harlem, I asked if Charter would provide free or low cost internet for our public school students shortly after you announced you would and you did it for free. Uh, so I wanted to thank you for that as well. And just again, it's all about the public private partnerships. Got two questions. I'm going to ask them up front this time. Uh, the first question is to Verizon. You mentioned affordable internet through Lifeline link up so many times. And I just went to sign up at your website and I was referred to a page. Uh, and so on this page, I, I tried to see if I could get them to uh, put this online uh, and mm -hmm. share it. But on this page, it says that you can only get this $20 a month, 200 megabit service in eight counties. None of them are New York City. So I guess the, the first question is right here, right now, will Verizon commit to Lifeline in New York City? Also, Lifeline is available for people who qualify for SNAP, Medicaid, and SSI. The program that we were able to work out with Charter and Altice uh, is actually for any child on free or reduced school lunch, about 800,000 of them here in New York City. Mm -hmm. So will you commit to doing so here? Uh, and if, if this website is wrong, will you promise to fix it immediately? The second question is, uh, as you may have read about in the New York Post, New York City is currently spending $10 a month for T-Mobile, for 4G, for 300,000 iPads, some $9 million in the first three months of the pandemic as part of a $269 million deal. Uh, and so I would just ask how much would Charter or Altice, and I'll even open it to Verizon, have charged in March and now in September to offer actual broadband speed uh, mm -hmm. at least three times faster to all of our public school students, given the fact that you're currently literally giving it away for free. Time expired. So council member, uh, you had about five questions baked in there, but let me try and answer all of them. Um, one is, uh, yes, the website uh, where I'm not sure where that is, it might be a dated page. But we, without question, have Lifeline customers in New York City, uh, lots of them. It's not just eight counties and other parts of New York State. Um, and yes, if you are Lifeline eligible uh, and a new customer, you're eligible for our, our uh, low cost broadband offer. But, um, if there's an outdated page, we will make sure that that's taken down. Um, in terms of your question about um, DOE, uh, I can't really comment um, on any discussions that Verizon may or may not have had with the Department of Education in March. But what I will say is that Department of Education has proudly been um, a Verizon customer for many years. We have a strong working relationship, both on our wireline and wireless side of the houses. And we're always looking for opportunities to partner for the benefit of New York City school children. Um, it would be, um, uh, I'd be unveiling um, or disclosing proprietary information if I spoke with any greater specificity, but we have a robust partnership, which, which we are strengthening every day uh, with the Department of Education for the benefit of the city of New York, uh, city of New York's children. I would just uh, add that, you know, we have as part of our suite of affordable offerings, we have our Stay Connected program, which is the program Rodney spoke of in our testimony, uh, whereby a school can do a bulk purchase of our internet service and keep a rotating set of students or educators on the account that's directly managed with us, but we actually provide the service to student or educator residences to facilitate um, virtual learning remote learning. 
And uh, that's a new product that we created uh, as the pandemic began. And we offer that at $29.99 uh, per month per user. And so, uh, you know, I won't get into specific uh, price points either, either, but that's a, that's a discounted uh, option that's available. Uh, it's also uh, 50 megabits per second, so a higher level of speed. And that's something that's available to all the schools in our uh, footprint. And so we think that could very much benefit uh, students in the school system today uh, and has the advantage of not having to uh, keep track and inventory and distribute uh, Wi-Fi or internet connected tablets. So uh, for Altice, uh, last year we really launched on this uh, really concerted effort to make sure that you know, our students had connectivity. So in addition to offering generally at first what, what, was, what initially was you know, these di discounted uh, Acer laptops, we launched a couple of events throughout our uh, footprint of the Bronx in Brooklyn to make sure that uh, uh, households with uh, children in New York City public schools had the opportunity to get a free uh, laptop uh, at those events which were held last year. Uh, in addition, we also have uh, have the, uh, the, the free student Wi-Fi program, uh, which we basically, uh, we extended to uh, the New York City public school system, whereas at no charge to uh, the student household, uh, students with a Mac enabled uh, uh, device were able to access the optimum Wi-Fi network free of charge. Um, so I think those are some of the things in addition to what I mentioned in regards to a centralized purchaser that we really have uh, made a really concerted effort to market because it does absolutely, absolutely no one any good uh, to have a service that no one knows about. Um, and working with our community stakeholders, working with you know, our CBOs that you know, function not just as places of personal and professional development, but also recreation and education to get the word out. Uh, so those are just a, a couple of things uh, that, the, that the company has done in regards to your, your, your question, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, Council, you were going to say something? Irene, were you going to say something? Yes, I was muted. I'm, I apologize. Council members, if you have any additional questions to this panelists, please use your raised hand function and as of right now, I do not see any more questions and I would like to welcome our next panel. And our next panel will be Virginia. Let me just say thank you very much to the panelists for uh, your testimony today. Uh, I think this is a start. Uh, we really need to come and revisit some of the things that, that, that we have been talking about here today. Um, you know, this is gonna be around for a while. So uh, I hope that we can continue that dialogue uh, moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving Thank us the opportunity. Much. Thank you. Thank we'll you. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Now I want to turn it back to you, uh, Council. Thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. And I would like now to welcome our next panel, Ms. Virginia Adams from Starry Internet, if she's still available, and Robert Bexler from Brooklyn Fiber. Once your name is called to testify, our staff will unmute you and then Surgeon at Arms will set the timer to announce that you may begin. Please confirm that your mic is unmuted before you begin speaking. Your testimony will be limited to two minutes and council members will have an opportunity to ask questions after each panel of witnesses. Ms. Abrams, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation, EFL, and affiliation for the record. You might begin now. Your time starts now. Good afternoon, Chairman Moya, Chairman Holden, Public Advocate Williams, and distinguished members of the Committee on Technology and Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. My name is Virginia Lom Abrams, and I am Senior Vice President of Government Affairs and Strategic Advancement for Starry. Starry is a wideband hybrid fiber wireless internet service provider and we've expanded our affordable high quality broadband services over the last year and a half to New York City. Our mission is to expand affordable broadband access using our innovative last mile wireless technology. 
Starry connects households to a gigabit quality internet connection at 100th the cost of laying fiber to the home with little to no disruption to the communities we serve. As you all know, the digital gap in New York City is not about access, it's about affordability. And super fast broadband is available, but it remains frustratingly out of reach for millions of families due to costs, the consequences of an uncompetitive broadband market. So how do we begin to solve this problem? Through healthy, robust broadband competition. Today, across the five boroughs, competitive residential broadband exists almost exclusively in high density neighborhoods with high income households. This is where innovative broadband technologies like Starry play a critical role in helping drive competition. Our technology efficiency enables us to offer Starry Connect, a partnership program with public and affordable housing owners to provide a $15 high speed symmetrical broadband option without data caps, costly TV bundles or long term contracts, but most importantly without credit checks or individual eligibility requirements. Today, more than 23,000 units of public and affordable housing participate in our Starry Connect program, and 15,000 of those units are located right here in New York City. Last week, we announced an innovative partnership between Starry, Microsoft, and the City of Los Angeles to bring Starry Connect to more than 9,000 public housing residents, and we're actively working to bring a similar program to NYCHA. But there is more work to do, and smart policies at the federal, state, and local levels are key to advancing these efforts. I I also echo Verizon's testimony that exclusive agreements that bar competitive broadband access are a key barrier to expanding affordable access in MDUs. We've provided additional detail in our written testimony and Chairman Moya, Chairman Holden and distinguished members of the committee, I thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Abrams. And Mr. Bexler, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Hello, everyone. Sorry. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Robert Vexler, and I'm the co-founder of Brooklyn Fiber, a wholly independent, net neutral, no contract, no install fee, no price creep internet service provider. What that means is we have never charged our, any of our customers to install our service. We've never held them to a contract, and our plan prices never go up. If you have been our customer since 2012, you are paying the same price for internet service you did eight years ago. We have no fine print in our plans. We've been providing service to what have been called dig digital deserts for about 10 years. The thing with these digital deserts is they are spread throughout Brooklyn, one of the most populous and advanced cities in the world. Um, we provide service to people and businesses who before us had limited or no access to broadband. If they are lucky, they have a choice between Spectrum and Verizon. Um, often they only have a choice of one of these providers. As a small provider <clears throat> without access to unlimited resources, and open-ended franchise agreements, we have been running service to our customers through a hybrid model. Fiber runs where we can and fixed wireless connections everywhere else. <clears throat> fixed wireless gives us the ability to bring incredibly high-speed internet into practically any building in New York City. And our time to deployment is days instead of months or years. We have uh, the issues we have run into apart from this being an incredibly expensive endeavor stem primarily from access. For instance, we cannot set up on top of a NYSHA buildings, even though we are the main uplink to several NYSHA focused broadband initiatives. In working with NYSHA, we have had to work around the lack of access by attempting to beam open Wi-Fi networks into buildings. This is what we did for NYSHA residents free of charge during Hurricane Sandy. <clears throat> Needless to say, this is not a viable solution. If access to city buildings and infrastructure became less of a hurdle for companies such as my own, we could then set up last mile, um, last miling to millions of New Yorkers that have poor to extremely limited and oftentimes much too expensive options for internet service. We receive calls all day every day from people who are either forced to sign up for egregiously expensive plans or simply have one option for service. That in and of itself is a major cause for concern. These are people that now more than ever need affordable and reliable internet access for their families. The woeful state of New York City's internet um, infrastructure should be ringing alarm bells throughout the city council and all facets, of, all facets of government planning. You shouldn't be looking at this as a pothole problem in an otherwise decent road system. You should be looking at this as though the BQE or the Bell Parkway simply ceased to exist. And on franchises, inter, instead of providers doubling efforts for coverage by running fiber twice or even three times to each area, the city should be running this fiber. 
The current system causes providers to double their efforts. The city is generating franchise fees through the scheme, but it does seem short-sighted. It would have been, it would have a far greater impact if the city lowered or removed these franchise costs altogether and ultimately looked at expanding overall broadband, broadband coverage by running city-owned fiber and charging providers for access. This would not only solve the problem of access to all New York City residents, but lead to less infrastructure build out and interruption. And counselors, when considering what speeds are, be, are being provided to lower income families through the universal broadband program, I would ask providers about download and- uh, we, gotta, we gotta wrap it up, time, time uh -huh. is expired. So can you wrap it up right now? Yeah, sure. So I would ask yeah, providers yeah, about download and upload speeds. The FCC minimums are, going to be anemic for any family with multiple children doing remote learning or Zoom-based classes. Not all the incumbents seem to, be, seem to be providing an acceptable level of service for typical home use today. We have very specific ideas on how right, to address Rob, this thank problem. Thank you, I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you for your testimony. Okay. Uh, we're gonna move into uh, council member questions. Uh, Chair Holden, do you have uh, any questions for the yeah I, yeah, I just want to mention, I want to ask a question of the, these uh, two providers, which are, they're wireless, right? They're both wireless. Do, do the exclusive agreements that you're running in with building owners, is that your biggest hurdle with the wireless uh, providers? Anybody? All right, let's, let's unmute uh, Virginia, if we could. Uh, thank you for the question, Chairman Holden. Um, I would say that it's twofold issues, particularly um, in urban areas. Um, one, it is these exclusive arrangements that are set up with um, building owners that can bar competition or at least deter uh, competition in the MDU environment. Uh, there is a proceeding currently in front of the Federal Communications Commission that is looking into these arrangements, whether they're exclusive marketing agreements, exclusive revenue agreements, or other um, essentially contracts between incumbent providers and building owners that um, that essentially act as exclusive service arrangements, which are prohibited under the FCC. So that's certainly in a, um, a dense uh, urban environment like New York City um, is an enormous hur hurdle. Uh, the second piece uh, for us as a fixed wireless provider is the permitting um, process within the city. Um, oftentimes that can extend beyond 90 days and those, uh, they, like they say, time is money. And for each month that we uh, can't deploy our network, that's, uh, that's a cost to us. And it really deters our ability to continue to roll out our affordable broadband access. So um, those are the two largest hurdles that we see in this, is, in this environment. So, so what's, the, what's the agency that you're having the most problems with in the city? So we work with the Department of Buildings to uh, to go through our permitting process. And and there they take a very very long time. Surprise surprise. Um, <laughs> uh, however, um, what percentage would you say of buildings that you approach have that um, exclusive agreement? The uh, not only marketing but the uh, the access. Um, Across all the five metro areas that we operate in today, um, for apartment buildings that have 50 units or more, it's 100% of all buildings have some type of exclusive arrangement, whether it's a marketing agreement, a revenue agreement, a wiring agreement, a molding agreement. I echo uh, uh, the, the previous panel's um, testimony on um, why it's expensive to deploy in public housing and affordable housing, because often the incumbent provider will not allow access to the molding. So we have to build in our new molding. We have to pull in new wiring. We have to do all that core drilling. So um, these are our barriers to entry, particularly for, um, for startup uh, providers like Starry and, and others that are trying to come in and provide competition. Yeah, I would think that's, uh, again, the people paying, the customers are paying the price for the lack of competition. So this should be a number one priority of New York City to, to try to get rid of this and um, the, these uh, service agreements which uh, and marketing agreements, which, you know, like you said, the, it's, it's a violation, uh, obviously, um, and they, they shouldn't get away with it. So we need to focus on that. I'll have my committee look at that a little deeper and um, we'll certainly uh, hopefully address that because uh, startups can't get a foothold and the, and the customers are obviously uh, paying the price, uh, New York City residents. And if you're saying it's 100% in one way or another, that's even more alarming. 
Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Chair Holden. Uh, Council, is there any other uh, council members that uh, have any questions for this panel? I do not see any more questions from council members and therefore would like now to welcome our next panel. Our next panel will be Ali Baum from New York Civil Liberties Union, Lance Van Arsdale from Local 3, and Will Lachman from Tech Action Working Group. Ms. Baum, you please indicate your name and your affiliation before you start your testimony and you can begin now. Time starts now. I'm Ali Baum on behalf of the NYCLU. Thank you for holding this timely hearing. Even as the city slowly reopens, many of us continue to rely on the internet to work, attend school, go to the doctor, seek entertainment, and visit with loved ones. Predictably, the brunt of the digital divide falls on particular communities. More than 40% of residents in specific neighborhoods in every single borough of this city lack internet access. In the Bronx, there is hardly a census tract east of Riverdale, where more than 70% of the population has broadband connectivity. These communities are homes to individuals who disproportionately live at the intersections of poverty and structural racism. 46% of city households living below the poverty line do not have home internet. Statewide, about 30% of Latinx and Black New Yorkers lack broadband connectivity, compared with 20% of white New Yorkers. The majority of communities lacking connectivity were graded as hazardous by the federal government's Home Owners Loan Corporation between 1935 and 1940, which meant that lenders would refuse to make loans in these areas. This discriminatory application of credit known as redlining was an explicitly race-based policy designed to keep racial and ethnic minorities in poverty. Today's digital redlining, the dearth of internet access in these neighborhoods serves the same function. We are glad that the city is focusing on ways to expand broadband access, and we appreciate that it is prioritizing NYSHA housing. As the city looks for additional ways to increase access, we encourage council members to consider all options, including expanding franchise authority, distributing mobile hotspots to students, ensuring internet access at homeless shelters, and municipal broadband. Whichever approaches the city chooses, it must ensure that those with the most acute need are prioritized, that broadband is affordable, and that any new broadband comes equipped with privacy and net neutrality protections. Unfortunately, the city has not always honored these priorities. For example, the Link NYC public Wi-Fi kiosks are mostly located in affluent neighborhoods and do not offer the speed and reliability of a broadband connection. In addition, they collect personal information about individuals who use them and passers-by. And to date, we have not seen a detailed list of the sensors included in the kiosks, nor how Link NYC uses the personal information it collects. The city must do better this time. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Baum, for your testimony. Mr. Van Arsdale, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You might begin now. Um, it starts now. Good evening, Chairman Holden and Moya and members of the committee. My name is uh, Lance Van Arsdale, Assistant Business Manager of Local 3 of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, AFL-CIO. Local 3 represents nearly 30,000 members who work throughout New York City. <clears throat> As you're aware, Local 3 is the certified collective bargaining representative for approximately 1,800 cable service technicians who work for Charter Communications in connection with its cable television franchise. Additionally, approximately 10,000 Local 3 journey person and apprentice electricians work for various contractors that install and construct the infrastructure for all types of telecommunications throughout the city, including that which will be installed by the franchisees of the franchises that would be awarded pursuant to the authority of the authorizing resolution being considered today. Although cable, the cable television franchise is not the part of the scope of today's hearing, almost four years long labor dispute that continues to this day between local three and charter should necessitate stronger protections, not only for workers of any franchisees of New York City, but also consumers. Even though Dewitt determined that there were documented breaches 
of, of charter and the franchise agreement with New York City, charter has continued to operate without penalty. With the council's consideration of the authorizing resolution for franchises for telecommunication services today, which will presumably be followed by consideration of an authorizing resolution for cable television at a later date, the council has an enormous opportunity to ensure that any franchisee of the city be accountable and unable to exploit their workers or cheat the city or its customers. While federal law and regulations do limit the city's, the city's ability to regulate telecommunication franchises and the current state of the federal regu regulatory framework under the Trump administration is very pro telecommunication corporations, the city has the ability to regulate its inalienable property. Additionally, with the presidential election just a few weeks away, there is a very good possibility that a Biden administration would succeed the current administration and reverse a lot of the unfavorable regulatory changes that have been implemented. Given that prospect, the city might be prudent to delay to delay the franchise process until at least after the presidential election and a potential for a start of a new administration. Should the council proceed before that point, however, it, it should ensure to include in any authorizing resolution additional provisions designed to protect the public, to optimize revenue to be derived by the city and to prevent the exploitation of workers. Local three has previously proposed to Chair Moyer a revised authorization resolution for any future cable TV franchise, which would certainly be adapted for these other franchises or could be adapted. The proposal would require more extensive and more frequent independent auditing of do it franchises. Routine revenue reporting training, certification, and licensing requirements for workers of the franchisees and their subcontractors. Mr. Performing Mr. work yeah. in, on, or under the city's inalienable property. Labor standards and prevailing wage requirements and public to for its franchise agreement with the city. M the Mr. council has yeah. an One more thing. The council I has an enormous opportunity to ensure any franchise to the city be account accountable and unable to exploit the workers or cheats the city and its customers. Municipal broadband is the way to go. Municipal broadband is the way to go. I'm sorry to, 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 to cut you off. Uh, we, just have, we just have a time limit here. And you know I've, I've extended the time uh, a little more for you. Uh, if you can wrap this up in 10 seconds, if not, uh, you know, please, you know, you will be able to submit your, your testimony if you already haven't um, uh, through, through our website. So uh, if you could just wrap this up in 10 seconds, I'd greatly appreciate it, Mr. Van Arsdale. Okay. A public option, municipal broadband is the way to go that could deliver for, for New Yorkers. Thank you, Mr. Van Arzel, for your testimony. Uh, I just remind everyone, uh, we do have a time limit. If, if you don't get through your uh, entire testimony, uh, you could still submit it at uh, testimony at council.nyc.gov, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, and I thank you uh, for uh, your cooperation with this. I'm turning it back to our council, Irene. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Lockman, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You might begin now. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Will Luckman. I'm a Brooklyn resident in the 36th District and a volunteer organizer with the New York City Democratic Socialists of America Tech Action Working Group. Thank you, Chairpersons Moy and Holden for calling this hearing today. I'm grateful for the opportunity to discuss the city's efforts to bridge the digital divide and the need to do so with a publicly owned and operated municipal broadband network. My oral remarks today are an excerpt of written testimony being entered into the record. As the public advocate mentioned in his remarks, internet access is not some luxury commodity. 
Rather, it is a fundamental requirement for participation in contemporary daily life. As such, internet access must not be contingent upon someone's ability to pay or on whether it is profitable for a private company to connect them. The onus is on the government itself to ensure everyone is connected. Uh, there seems to be some broad agreement today that we need universal broadband in NYC. If the city is going to commit major capital outlays to get us there, and if we want some controls over the speed, price, neutrality, labor protections, uh, then instead of further subsidizing private providers, the city must act as a direct provider. We need to make an important distinction here. The internet master plan is not, uh, in fact, a new strategy as claimed by the CTO. At its core, the strategy outline relies on private public partnerships with private internet service providers. The city's tried this before, and the ISPs have proven time and again they're terrible partners. I remind the council that in 2017, the city was forced to sue Verizon. Uh, Charter Spectrum was caught lying about speeds of its services providing and was uh, sued by the state AG. City Bridge, who operates Link NYC, owes the city tens of millions of dollars uh, and has only been a built a fraction of the kiosks that we were promised. Um, and so I'll just wrap up by saying that uh, municipal broad, uh, broadband has three major advantages. First and foremost, the city can directly provide access where it's most needed, starting with uh, city owned properties like NYCHA, city shelters, and public schools. Second, the city will train control and oversight of such a system and can guarantee low costs and not have to worry about uh, these companies flaunting regulations. Uh, and third, uh, as we face the prospect of an economic downturn, uh, building out a city owned uh, system would ensure good public jobs uh, with labor protections built in because they're city jobs and you don't have to worry about trying to extract uh, these concessions from these private providers who've proven they won't do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, council members. If you have any questions, please, for the panelists, please use the raise hand function. And I see that council member Kellos. Hey, before, before we go to the council member, I just want to uh, ask a question really quickly. Oh, absolutely. I apologize. Yeah. No, it's okay. I mean, no worries. Uh, uh, Mr. Van Orsdale, are you still are you still on? Yes. Yeah. So can, can you just go back? I, I when you when you were going through your testimony. So so tell me again. Uh, you were you had said, and I and I missed it. I'm sorry. Uh, you had some suggestions of of how to. Uh, uh, amend this uh, authorizing resolution. Can you just go back to that? The, the authorizing res resolution needs protections for the consumers and the workers. Uh, as, the, as the last panelist stated, um, a, a charter uh, was, was caught lying about internet speeds, uh, not building out in rural communities in upstate New York, using addresses along the Gowanus Canal, sa saying that they were building out on, on uh, uh, rural communities. Uh, and, and there's franchises, uh, uh, Verizon Firehouse, that have not wired parts of the city. Um, well, what, what we're proposing is that there's worker protections as far as... Uh, collective bargaining and standards, prevailing wages, apprenticeships, local hiring. We're, we're also proposing uh, a municipal broadband uh, option for the city to go into. Right now, the city of New York is, is laying fiber throughout the city in their agencies. And that should be used as, as a stopgap, not to wipe out private competition, but to be part of the competition, to make it honest. Great, thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Van Arsdale, for that. And and with that, now um, just checking in, uh, Chair Holden, do you have any questions? No. All right. Uh, now I want to uh, turn it over to uh, Councilmember Kalos. Uh, I want to start with a thank you to Lance Van Arsdale from IBW Local Three, as well as your leadership at HTC, for accepting my invitation for you to come here today and just speak up for our workers and everything they've been going through, uh, I also, and so I guess my question for you is just, what has been the impact of some of the trade practices you've seen on people who live and work in the city and their even ability to access the internet? And then I guess for both you 
and, and Will Luckman um, from DSA, I would just say that I, I support a public option, whether it comes to healthcare or broadband. I think public options increase competition uh, and stop uh, market collusion and other problems that we see in the private sector. Uh, so um, I, I think you guys may have seen in the first couple of panels, I was trying to get to a commitment for municipal broadband. And uh, I think just as uh, Mr. Van Arsdale referred to, a commitment to get fiber laid for a, a municipal broadband as part of this current franchise. Uh, so I guess, do you, would you support that and, and that kind of public-private partnership to get to where we need to be? And, and, and last but not least, if uh, you guys want to continue working with me on this, if you email me policy at bencalos.com, I want to get this municipal broadband done so badly. It hurts. We need to bridge the digital divide. Local, local three proposes that municipal broadband would be uh, installed and serviced by um, prevailing wages that provide a pension and health care and retirement and, and, and a wage that is a livable wage in the city of New York and by city employees. Right now, city employees, local three members are installing fiber for the agencies in every, every part of the borough. FDNY, our members are installing a fiber system to all the pull stations on the corners. And the fiber that's being installed through good management of FDNY has enough capability to expand on these services. And, and if the, the tax structure is appropriate, once the Biden administration gets in and cleans out the FCC and, and has regulations where the city can actually provide taxes on the internet providers right now to provide a subsidy for this, where the city isn't laying out billions of dollars to do it, and also where it's an honest competitor to the rest of these services. Uh, the chairman just brought up the speeds on their low cost service that nobody knows about and nobody can get, and 30 megabits if you have two kids in a room doing their homework, nothing's gonna happen. And that's what we're living with right now. There's close to a million households in the city. It's not 600,000. It's close to a million that do not have broadband. Nobody's talked about the elderly yet. Nobody's talked about the people that have to live in homeless shelters. Those are the people that need it. And all the kids in NYCHA that can't do their homework right now. Yeah, I would just add that um, we can, uh, totally agree with the IBEW stance on this. Um, we think that we see this as a form of competition and, um, you know, the plan as the city has outlined it, it, it claims, you know, uh, that uh, we will compete, we'll increase competition, um, but we don't want them just auctioning off and giving away public assets um, before first assessing and seeing what capabilities we already have as a city. Um, you know, we've seen city agencies uh, like the FDNY, like the NYPD are perfectly capable of building out massive uh, broadband infrastructure. A lot of it already exists. And um, we just think that um, the city itself should not just be handing these things over um, and giving them away and then asking for price controls, asking for labor things after the fact when we could just be doing that ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Kalos. Uh, Council, do we have any other council members um, that have any other questions? I do not see any more questions from council members and would like to welcome our next panel. Our next panel will be Sandra Grizel from New York City Bar Association, Caitlin Andrews from Life On, Selena Trowell from Vocal NYC and Ben Finker from ARP. And Ms. Grizel, before you begin, please please state your name and affiliation for the record. You may begin now. Time begins now. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you council members. My name is Sandra Grussell and I'm a senior staff attorney at Mobilization for Justice. 
I am also a member of the New York City Bar Association, and today I am testifying on behalf of the City Bar Social Welfare Law Committee. We submitted written testimony jointly with the Education Committee, outlining in more detail the devastating impact of the stark digital divide on New York City's homeless population. But there are just a couple points I want to emphasize this afternoon. COVID-19 exacerbated what was already a homelessness crisis. While state regulations require that certain services be provided to shelter residents, city-funded shelters overwhelmingly lack one essential service, access to technology, including reliable high-speed internet. Even pre-pandemic, the lack of internet access was a huge barrier to individuals and families attempting to transition out of shelter and into permanent housing. You need the internet to search for apartment listings, scan roommate ads, and access Housing Connect, the city's online affordable housing portal. Obviously, the pandemic has exacerbated the impacts of the digital divide and raised the stakes to literally life or death. New Yorkers now need internet to apply for essential government benefits like food stamps, and homeless parents are now forced to risk their child's health and safety for the sake of their education or allow them to fall further behind with limited or inconsistent access to remote learning due to poor internet and cell service in shelters. In short, we're all dealing with a public health emergency and the city must act quickly in order to meet its basic responsibilities. The mayor's internet master plan is a start, but does not reference the unique access needs of shelter residents. The administration needs to clarify whether homeless shelters are included in the master plan, and if so, how are they being prioritized? There have been numerous references this afternoon to expanding residential broadband options, but what if- Time is expired. We thank the council um, for holding this hearing and urge you to work with the mayor's office and city agencies to ensure that homeless shelters are prioritized and in any plans to expand broadband and internet access. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. I apologize for mispronouncing your name. And Ms. Andrews, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Time begins now. Hello, my name is Caitlin Andrews. I'm the Director of Public Policy at Live On New York. Really quickly, Live On New York is a nonprofit in New York City that represents more than 100 community-based organizations that operate senior centers and other important programs throughout neighborhoods across the city. Since March, these programs have been offering services virtually and technology has been a huge way in which older adults continue to remain connected to the services and the programs that are important to them. Um, we really applaud the providers for continuing to make social engagement a priority and available during this time. And Live on New York actually created a website where older adults can find all the virtual programming um, that might be of interest to them during this time while they remain safe at home. Um, unfortunately, as has been indicated today, Price and costs of internet access is a huge barrier for older adults and has been increasingly problematic during the pandemic when older adults are forced to remain home to remain safe. The inability to afford internet access means missing out on real-time information, such as best practices regarding COVID, how to access food, online job opportunities, and more. Live on New York recommends that the city expand its own investment into the technology infrastructure of senior center providers in addition to older adults directly. The 10,000 NYCHA tablets are a great start. That was funded through CDBG federal funds and we believe that could be expanded. I also wanna note that senior centers have computer labs that have been shuttered since the pandemic began. And that really means that there are so many older adults that don't have a way to access the computers and technology that they once might have utilized. Um, so we really need a comprehensive plan for how to reopen senior centers and physically and safely and allow computer labs to remain or to become accessible to older adults again and, and what that might look like. Um, we also wanna quickly uh, draw attention to a state bill, um, assembly bill. Sure, 6679C, it's mouthful, um, but it's really important. Uh, we're encouraging the city council to encourage the governor to sign this bill, which has already been passed and would um, allow for an extensive survey of broadband connection throughout the state. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify and for all that has been said um, in support of access to internet for older adults. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. 
And our next panelist is Ms. Trowell. Ms. Trowell, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You may begin. It begins. My name is Lena Trowell. I'm the homelessness organizer of Vocal New York. And I'm sharing testimony on behalf of Vocal New York leader Felix Guzman, who does not have stable enough ac internet access or enough cell minutes to sustain the time that we had to wait to testify. So in the words of Mr. Felix Guzman, uh, we cannot yet provide applause for the mayor's plan of so-called innovation and inclusion that falls short of making any mention of our neighbors in shelter and unhoused on the street who are disproportionately black and brown and have experienced tremendous setback from lacking access to libraries, cafes, New York City link kiosks, subways for internet access. I firmly believe uh, that the right to internet access during and after COVID-19 is a human right for all. Having become homeless as a result of my mental health deteriorating as a male experiencing abuse at the hands of my former partner and my building being turned into a shelter, I was unprepared to navigate homelessness in New York City shelters. The experience was debilitating, disempowering, and demoralizing. I spent 15 and a half months in the shelter trying to leave of my own volition into appropriate housing, which would not have been possible without the access to internet. Amongst those amongst us who qualify for Medicaid are provided a lifeline mobile device. When phones are provided as lifelines have set minute counts and or data to keep connected, life turns into a game of trying to stay ahead of technological limitations. An individual who is connected to resources can navigate homelessness in a much healthier manner than those without. Another reason to push Wi-Fi for all would be that currently for some, hotlines that assist in maintaining safety, sobriety, and to a greater degree life are limited to their access. Where hotlines for domestic abuse, recovery support, and suicide prevention are favorite numbers and on speed dials for some, not providing a minute to stay continuously connected during COVID-19 pandemic is dangerous. People who are systemically oppressed and disadvantaged are the biggest consumers of mental health services, recovery intervention services, and are prone to becoming and staying homeless. To leave Time has expired. Thank you. Thank you so much. And our next panelist is Ms. Finkel. Ms. Finkel, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Time begins now. I am Beth Pink, I'm the State Director for AARP New York. We have uh, over three quarters of a million members in New York City, over two and a half million in New York State. And I'm here today because I really want to thank uh, Chair Holden, um, Council Members Moya, and uh, Ben Kalos. We really appreciate you having this hearing today and giving us the opportunity to speak. We know that in 2019, uh, controller Scott Stringer did a report on access and it really showed that 42% of New Yorkers that are 65 plus lack access compared to 23% of younger generations and 30% of Black and Latino New Yorkers lack access compared to 20% of white New Yorkers. We've been working together with the NAACP, the Urban League, the Hispanic Federation, and the Asian American Federation to put an end to this digital divide. Um, we came out with a paper on disrupting racial and ethnic disparities, and we have another one coming out uh, next month that's really gonna focus on this even more. Um, right now, I wanted to bring your attention to the way that, um, that we measure whether people have access to uh, Wi-Fi. Um, we looked at the FCC's 477 data which maps broadband access and is insufficiently granular. Well, there's no way that we can ever make sure that we have coverage if we're not sure about how we're assessing that. So um, we really are anxious to have a change because right now the, the methodology considers an entire census block served if at least one household has service. That's not really talking about a, the full census block. Otherwise, we're comparing apples and oranges. Uh, I also want to make sure that, uh, as uh, Live on New York stated, that again, back to this data issue, that there's a-, a Time is expired. Sorry, we need, we need the governor to sign the S8805 Metzger and A6679C Lion, which was passed unanimously by the State Assembly and also by the State Senate, which would 
require the Public Service Commission to collect more granular data. So again, I want to thank you. I know everyone explained why this is important to older people. Our members are 50 plus. Um, telehealth, isolation, you go through all the whole list, but I think you've already heard it. I want to thank you very much, and everything is in my written testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And I want to turn to our chairs if they have any questions to this panel. Thank you. I just have uh, one quick question. I want to go uh, back to, to Sandra. Is she still on? Do we still have Sandra or did we lose her? I'm checking right now. Okay. I'm here, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Listen, you, you brought up you brought up an important issue, and uh, Ms. Van Arsdale touched upon it a little bit. But it, it really dealt with uh, uh, homeless kids and homeless students. So, I, I just want, I'm going to ask you this. You, if you know the answer, great. But if not, uh, I thought it's it's important to to, to put out there. Uh, so you being on the ground there, like, what is the best way to ensure uh, that homeless students, uh, both living in shelters uh, and doubled up in uh, who are unsheltered as well, uh, are able to connect to the internet um, at the places where they're living so that they can uh, keep pace with the classmates during remote learning? That is such a good question. And full disclosure, I am not uh, an education specialist and I don't typically work with children or youth but our other committee members can follow up with you. Our written testimony has some recommendations um, and I'd also refer you to the City Bar Justice's report they issued in May on shelter access issues. But basic summary is that the, the devices are only so good as the means to access their potential. And so my understanding is that um, there have been a lot of difficulties actually using the devices that students are getting due to some shelters having very poor uh, cellular service, some shelters not having any cellular service. So you need the device, you need the space as you alluded to, to use the device in a meaningful way. Um, and you need the ancillary equipment, which might mean access to a printer um, or related devices. Um, and you need the connectivity, uh, whether that's internet, cell service, both ideally, but um, our education committee members can follow up with you with more details. Great, thank you. Um, I just have a question uh, for Sandra again. Um, have you seen um, the lack where, where certain shelters or even uh, hotels, hotel rooms don't have uh, access, internet access and are counseling services delivered through the, uh, Zoom or uh, um, online? In, in some of these shelters? We can mute, Sandra. Thank okay. you, yes, I'm unmuted now. All right. Um, so that's a really good question. And again, the, the City Bar Justice Center did a survey of several shelters they partner with um, in regards to internet access. And most shelters, uh, residents are not able to access the internet. If they are accessing the internet it's at all, it's through their personal cell phone devices, which we heard um, testimony earlier about how difficult that is when you have limited data plans. Thank you. Council members, do we have any more questions? I do not see any more questions from council members. Chairs, do you have any more questions? No. No. Thank you. Thank you again for your testimony. And now I would like to welcome our next panel. And our next panel will be Muhammad Asagi from NYC Math, Noel Haldalgo from Beta NYC, Sarah from Advocates for Children's Children of New York, David Drink from Bay Ridge Center, and David Jones. Mr. Asagi, 
Asagri. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You may begin now. Time starts. Hi, my name is Mohamed Eskari. Uh, thank you, Chairman Moya Holden. Uh, Council Member Kalos and staff for organizing this hearing. I appreciate the opportunity to testify. I would like to talk about the importance of community networks and community access to public infrastructure as it relates to the digital divide in today's resolution. When the internet master plan was unveiled in January, broadband internet access was characterized as essential to life and work in the city. No one could have predicted that in the months to follow, broadband access would determine one's ability to receive an education or to be able to work. The gap in broadband coverage disproportionately affects black and Hispanic communities and is therefore a racial and economic justice issue. The network infrastructure we have today, which was built by the private sector, continues to expand alongside segregated neighborhood lines. This should not be surprising since a profit-driven model for infrastructure development will inevitably serve rich neighborhoods more than it serves the poor. In contrast, a community network can serve to bridge the broadband gap during this crucial time by allowing communities to mobilize and to create infrastructure that's critical to their everyday lives. The city, the, the city should look to successful implementations of, of community networks and support them. NYC Mesh is one, ex one example of such networks. NYC Mesh is a nonprofit and community owned and operated fixed wireless mesh network. It is resilient, fast, net neutral, and open for all New Yorkers to use and join free of charge. The majority of the network users reside in neighborhoods with low and moderate low broadband adoption, according to the master plan. And I encourage you to compare the maps which I've included in the written testimony. Community networks and big player ISDs do not operate on a level playing field. So the process of granting franchises as described in this resolution does not necessarily benefit community networks. The big ISVs which currently monopolize the market have greater buying power and a greater network of information and influence to rent city property with no incentive to serve neighborhoods that are not profitable. Any regulatory regime should work to break up these large monopolies. I have four suggestions for actions the city can take to support broadband infrastructure for all. One, give nonprofit community networks uh, access to a fiber optic municipal broadband to build fixed wireless ne uh, mesh networks on top of. Two, give uh, nonprofit community networks priority access to city rooftops and facilities to install wireless routers. Three, make all processes addressing the digital divide open and participatory. Actively involve advocates and community organizations in the process. And four, have clear forums for community oversight and implement community ownership of network infrastructure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony and our next Panelist is Noel Heldalgo. Mr. Heldalgo, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Hello, my name is Noel or Noel Hidalgo. Uh, I'm a Gemini. Uh, my organization is Beta NYC, um, and it's a real pleasure to be in front of the City Council member Moya and Holden and Council staff. Thank you for your dedication to this particular issue. Um, I'm gonna. I have uh, written remarks um, that I'm going to reserve um, and and email in, but I want to focus exclusively on the fact that um, and echo some of the comments that were made uh, throughout this testimony. Uh, first and foremost. Um, it is remarkable that, that we are um, seven years into this administration. There has been at least three different declarations of broadband for all initiatives. Um, and yet we are once again at a master plan. We hope that the other uh, attempts were really kind of experimentations and understanding of where we are. Uh, but it's really remarkable um, that we are 14 months until this administration walks out and they have produced a massive uh, unbelievable uh, internet master plan, which is great. I don't wanna discount that at all. Um, what I want to point out is that for this master plan to actually exist and to, to, to work well, is that we need digitally literate elected officials and government staffers. Uh, we need non-greedy corporations and we need a public that can hold the two accountable. Um, with that, I wanna point out that this report doesn't necessarily address the city's aging digital government, uh, digital government services. Um, the CTO coordinates strategy, but implementation is vague. The cost of the master plan is somewhere between 4.4 billion to 6.7 billion dollars and it still leaves out public spaces like all of the city's parks governors wards island and rikers island um 
now, in regards to the resolution, it would be great if the mayoral administration would put the master plan as a priority for the next 14 months, though with the ch changing cast of technology leadership that we've had in this administration, we find that unlikely. Um, we would hope that the franchise profits, started. thank you, uh, the franchise profits support digital literacy programs and that the McBride principles clause um, that are truly baked into the master, uh, the franchise agreements. Uh, lastly, we call for a database of all franchise agreements that do it has. Um, we would like those uh, databases to be machine readable because we cannot search uh, scanned PDFs. And I will leave uh, the details of the database desires into my written testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hidalgo, thank you for your testimony. And our next panelist is Sarah Bard. Ms. Bard, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You may begin now. Time begins. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about the digital divide. My name is Sarah Part, and I'm a policy analyst at Advocates for Children of New York. For nearly 50 years, Advocates for Children has worked to ensure a high quality education for New York students who face barriers to academic success, focusing on students from low income backgrounds. The digital divide has major consequences for public education, particularly at a time when nearly all students are expected to learn remotely between two and five days per week. While online learning is a poor substitute for the in person classroom experience for the vast majority of students. For those who do not have broadband internet at home, the challenges of remote instruction are exponentially greater. And as low-income children, children of color, and children from immigrant families are among the least likely to have reliable high-speed internet access, we are deeply concerned that the digital divide will further exacerbate existing racial and socioeconomic disparities in the coming year. Well, we appreciate that the city has distributed several hundred thousand iPads with free cellular data to students who need such devices, this has by no means solved the problem. In the past few weeks, AFC has heard from dozens of families whose children were unable to participate in online instruction because they had yet to receive an iPad or because their device was not working due to lack of connectivity or other challenges. We have particular concerns about city shelters, most of which lack Wi-Fi and some of which do not even have the cellular reception needed for the iPads to work. It is unacceptable that nearly seven months after remote learning first began, students around the city, including students living in city contracted shelters, are still unable to get online for school. While the pandemic magnified the impact of the digital divide, unequal access to broadband contributed to educational inequities long before COVID-19. Even when classroom instruction is fully in person, internet access is often required or at least extremely helpful for completing homework assignments. In addition, more and more the DOE is relying on parents to have reliable internet access in order to get critical information about their children's education. For example, families of, families of students receiving yellow bus service are no longer receiving hard copy letters with information about their child's route. Knowing what time to have your child ready for pickup requires logging in to your NYC school's account online. Kindergarten, middle, and high school applications have also moved online in recent years, meaning the extent to which a family is able to participate in these processes and research a wide range of schools depends on their level of digital literacy and their access to the internet. In 2020, equitable access to a quality education cannot exist without equitable access to the internet. The city must act urgently to ensure that every student has the fast, reliable connectivity they need in order to participate in remote learning this year and access to educational information in the long term. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Part, for your testimony. And our next panelist is David Drink. Mr. Drink, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You may begin now. Time begins. Um, hello, and thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important uh, low cost, high speed connectivity topic, as well as bridging, bridging the digital divide for older adults. I'm David Drink, Director of Innovative Programs uh, at Bay Ridge Center. Uh, we serve over a thousand older New Yorkers in the southwestern corner of Brooklyn through home delivered meals, senior center activities, and operating a neighborhood naturally occurring retirement community. When the pandemic halted in person programming at our center, we acted quickly to launch virtual programs and have done over 670 since September to over 5,700 older adults. We estimate there are still 3,000 older adults that may like to participate if they had the technology or were properly trained and supported. We witnessed the impact of our virtual programs on our clients in many ways. There were clients 
who said that they were going stir crazy and the classes that they attended helped them manage their isolation. There were clients who lost loved ones and these, cl and these classes were a lifeline to managing their grief. Our meditation and exercise classes are popular with our clients whom have told us they want to keep their bodies as well as minds flexible and open so that they can adapt and handle these challenging times. I also want to praise the state for the comprehensive broadband connectivity app that was mentioned earlier. It states the legislator hereby finds and declares that access to high-speed internet is a fundamental right, and it is incumbent upon the state to ensure the provision of this right to every New Yorker. Um, it is terrific to hear that access to high-speed internet is a fundamental right. However, it doesn't say that it is affordable high-speed internet connectivity. We surveyed our members in March and discovered that 40% of them are without connectivity. It is in order for connectivity to be a fundamental right, it must be affordable for all, which is the third principle of the mayor's internet. Time has expired. So I just want to end with saying that connectivity is essential ingredient, ingredient to bridging the digital divide and that I really appreciate the city council uh, for taking on this hearing and that Bay Ridge Center is happy to partner or collaborate with the city council or the mayor's office to figure out the best ways to ensure that all older New Yorkers have access to the internet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dring, for your testimony. And our next panelist is David Jones. Mr. Jones, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You might begin now. Time begins. Hello, I am David Jones, founder of The Code. And um, The Code, we are launching and we're actually implementing throughout New York City schools and are the community. And the premise of The Code is to take students from being consumers of technology to builders of technology, uh, basically sparking the next mind of a Mark Zuckerberg and are creating Mark Zuckerberg's competition. And so we've been um, actually supported and championed by uh, Brooklyn Borough President uh, Eric Adams, as well as Senator Kevin Parker. And I uh, actually want to thank uh, Charter Spectrum for their donation of laptops, whereas we are utilizing those laptops to actually create a computer lab this week in Vanderveer Estates and or uh, Flatbush Gardens, as currently called and or affectionately known as Veer for people who live in the community or the city of Brooklyn. And also, we will just be disseminating those uh, laptops throughout the schools that we're working with for our coding program. And I was going to speak about, um, you know, the importance of broadband and or the importance of equipment. But I kind of, and that's been spoken about. So I kind of want to jump to training. Uh, if D O I T T, and it it was shown or it was spoken that not many of the um, people they may have sent information to. Uh, to participate in their trainings, not many participated. Well, you would have to think that if a person is just receiving a device, it's highly likely or highly unlikely that they have Microsoft Office and or know how to use Microsoft Office. So it's very important that um, on the ground that we have training for um, people who actually receive broadband, who actually receive the devices. And I would think that DOITT would have to um, use more grassroots roots methods. Because um, again, if a person is not digitally savvy, then they're not going to receive that information. So more grassroots efforts as far as getting the information out there from broadband companies and their, um, their services and or um, just information itself as far as training is concerned working with nonprofit organizations that are more grassroots or feet and our hands on the ground will get the information out um, more efficiently. And I will be speaking with um, you guys more um, frequently as again, we're, we're, implementing, we're implementing our program throughout New York City schools, starting with 20 schools, high schools within um, Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island and Manhattan. Thank you for your testimony. And now I want to ask if any council members or our chairs would like to ask any questions to this panel. No, I mean, thank you. I do not see any questions and would like to welcome our next panel. And our next panel will be Troy Wilcott, Guam 
Kadar, if he's still available, and Tio Chino. And Mr. Walcott will be our next panelist. Mr. Walcott, before you begin, please state your name and your affiliation for the record. You might begin now. I begin. Can you hear me? Troy Walcott, uh, Local 3 IBEW member on strike from Spectrum for three and a half years now. Um, I just wanted to briefly speak. It's a little different than the full uh, statement that I wanted to give. I was listening to some of the statements as the testimony was going on. I thought it was definitely funny how Verizon, the company, only one with the union workforce seemed to offer the best services available to the underserved areas. I, I found that interesting. Um, I wanted to speak about specifically Spectrum Cable as they come and also try to give their best face forward as what they have provided for the city and give some backstory about what they've done in the city as far as I've seen. They spoke uh, briefly about them having a 70% minority workforce. Meanwhile, there's a 80% workforce that minorities that they disbanded in order to put people in place that they can have total control over. Um, related to their relationship with labor, there's also been evidence where Spectrum has taken workers who are in supervisory positions and put them in positions of technicians in order to try to put a decertification attempt in order to move Local 3 from outside of the bargain unit for that company. They also joined on with other companies piling on an attacks for peg stations, which are a staple to New York City. Um, I would like to speak about their failure to provide to underserved areas they promised to do while taking on the merger agreement for the city. They speak of their affordable service while doing constant rake heights since they've been in the city, offering customers who were they called legacy customers into spectrum packages and once they found out that they had no alternative to turn back, nothing else they could do because they had nowhere to go. They speak about bridging the digital divide and they asked the FCC to block funding to providers who were trying to provide to the very areas that they were charged from the Public Service Commission for not serving. Time has um, expired. Um, once again, I just wanted to share that the good actors that they claim to be within this city they have shown not to be from the short time they've been here. And if we allow them to continue unimpeded, I see it only getting worse from here on out. Mr. Walcott, thank you for your testimony. And our next panelist is Tio Chino. Mr. Chino, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You might begin now. Uh, hold on. I'm Can you see me? Uh, I have a problem. Hold on. Sorry. Apologize. No problem. Hold on. Oh my God, this thing doesn't work. Hold on. We are. We hear Sorry. you. You can hear me. We can hear you. Oh, I wanted you to see me because that's. Uh, hold on, I'm. I'm dealing with. He just changed All everything. Right. We. We can. We can hear you, Theo. That's the main thing, and you can always submit your testimony if you're having uh, some trouble. Okay. There yeah. you go. Yeah, you can see me. Ah, we got you. Yeah. All right. Dear councilman, thank you for your time. You got uh, it. My my name is Theo Chino. I am part of New York City Privacy. I am part of Restore the Force, Rep My Block, and Show the Book. If you're seeing me like this today, it's because I'm being waiting for my super, and this is what it looks to work dirty, cold, and hungry. The discussion you have had right now is incredible because this is all the people who have testified before me said it clearly. In 2004, I was hired by Time Warner Cable to build, rebuild the version two of the internet. And in 2008, the DTV. During Sandy, I kept Time Warner Cable TV running with five employees. Today, if Sandy were to hit again because the base of operation is in Denver, there would be no communication in case of an emergency with Spectrum TV. The problem that has been exploded by being explained by Local Tree is real. I was there when they de and the moment they de they also gave me the boot. They told me I had to go to Denver or I would be laid off. Obviously, I'm still in New York and everything. Regarding the internet and the public internet option, the public advocate is the chair of COPIC, the communication 
the communication on public information and the information and communication. He has not met and all the tools that are given free by the community, the tools are being used by Verizon, Charter, and any company that call themselves high tech, they're built upon the free labor that community activists like Mohammed with the Mesh Network, all those things, basically they take our ideas, we give it for free and they monetize it. Obviously, the person who was the CEO of Brooklyn K... Uh... Time has expired. Thank you, Leo. Thank you for your testimony today. Yeah, I wanna thank Mr. Chio again. And I wanna ask our chairs and council members if you have any questions to this panel. No, I see no questions uh, from our council members. And this was our last panel. And this concludes the public testimony. If I have forgotten to call on someone to testify, if that person could raise their hand using Zoom raise hand function, I will try to hear from you now. I do not see anyone. Um, and I will now turn over to our chair, Chair Moya, to close the hearing. Thank you so much uh, to our council uh, for this. Uh, there being no other members of the public who wish to testify on the pre-considered authorizing resolution or oversight committee, uh, these items are now closed. I would like to uh, thank the administrations, uh, the administration, members of the public, my colleagues, the committee council, the land use staff, the tech committee staff, and the sergeant at arms for participating in today's hearing. But before I adjourn, I just wanted to see if uh, Chair Holden had um, any closing remarks as well. Well, I just want to thank everyone that you just thanked. And uh, it was a terrific hearing, I think. Uh, I think we learned a lot and we have a lot of work to do uh, to address some of the uh, concerns that we heard today. And um, I think, um, we, like, I, like we've learned, um, there is a digital divide and this administration did very little in the last seven years. We have a lot of work to do and I just hope they get moving. But um, given their track record, uh, I think it's up to the council to stay after the administration to push some of the changes that um, we heard today that need to be done. But thank you, Chair Moria. And, and, and I wanna thank the committee council, Irene uh, Bohofsky for doing such a great job and the land use, uh, uh, obviously the land use committee for their terrific work today. Thank you, Chair Moria. Thank you, thank you Chair Holden. Uh, yes, uh, my personal note of privilege here. Uh, thank you, Irene, and thank you, uh, Malika, and thank you to uh, Julie Lubin uh, for the tremendous work uh, and effort that went into putting this together. Uh, this was uh, a very insightful and informative hearing uh, that I think will uh, help us uh, really shape the conversation uh, as we go forward. Uh, and that could not uh, have been done uh, without your incredible uh, work and effort that went into this. So uh, thank you to uh, all of you and to, of course, uh, our Sergeant at Arms for uh, always uh, keeping order here and um, keeping uh, the Zooms going as, as smoothly as possible. So thank you very much. Uh, and with that, uh, this meeting is uh, hereby.